Uh, I'd like to call the uh, hearing to order this morning. And today's uh, topic is the Environmental Protection Agency's FY 2014 budget. Uh, we're delighted that the acting administrator, uh, Mr. Perchesepi, is here with us today. And uh, we had a nice meeting with him yesterday as well. And we look forward to his testimony. And we e really look forward to the questions and answer period as well. So uh, uh, we, we welcome him. And uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for, for oh, three. three minutes. I only get three minutes. So I recognize myself for three minutes for an opening statement. Does Mr. Rush get five minutes? Five minutes. Or three? Everyone okay. gets three. Rush gets none. <laughs> okay. okay, well, thank you. Um, this morning's hearing is on the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed budget for fiscal year 2014. I might say in the beginning that I don't think America needs to take a back seat to any country in the world when it comes to doing an effective job of maintaining a clean environment, whether it's water, hazardous air pollutants, ozone, ambient air quality standards, clean air, whatever it might be. And even our CO2 emissions, emissions are lower than they've been in 20 years. Now, the budget for the EPA this year request is $8.153 billion. And the Obama administration, EPA, has been as aggressive as any agency in the federal government in recent years. As a matter of fact, in 2012, EPA finalized 635 rules spanning 5,637 pages in the Federal Register. And I think this administration has demonstrated an ability to take each tax dollar given to it and return to the American people many more dollars in regulatory cost. The Utility Mac rule alone has been estimated by the agency, which many people say to be conservative, to cost $9.6 billion annually, more than the entire budget proposal for the uh, agency. And this rule is but one of many recent EPA measures targeting coal-fired electric generation. Now, President Obama always talks about all of the above policy, and yet his administration is doing everything possible to eliminate coal from the equation. The, 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 the rules already issued have closed down over 289 coal-powered plants. And these regulations go way beyond just coal. EPA's new CAFE rules for cars and small trucks are estimated by the agency to cost $210 billion by 2025. Now, we know that there are benefits, but we also know that when fully implemented, these rules alone will add nearly $3,000 to the sticker price of an automobile. And so you ask the question, when do you reach a point of diminishing returns? We know that these regulatory, there are benefits from these regulations, but the costs are also very real, and many people lose jobs. Many people lose their health benefits because of losing their jobs. And frequently, EPA does not even consider those costs. So uh, this is going to be an interesting hearing. I know that the members of this subcommittee have many questions on both sides of the aisle. And uh, we will we'll look forward to uh, Mr. Perchesepi's uh, testimony and to the question and answer period. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois for three minutes. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly want to thank you, uh, Acting Administrator, Administrator Perciseppe, for being here today. And I would also want to take a moment to thank all the good people over at the EPA for all their hard work and all their dedication, protecting their public health on behalf of the American people. Mr. Administrator, I do not envy the task that you all face over there at the EPA, being responsible for protecting the nation's land and air and water, especially in the face of cut after cut, criticism after criticism, charge after the charge. Uh, 
But I know one thing that the people of my state in Illinois, and particularly the people in a place uh, called the village of Crestwood, which is located in my district, certainly appreciate all the work that you do. EPA played a critical role in helping to finally bring to justice the public officials who are responsible for illegally pumping contaminated water into the homes of my constituents in the village of Crestwood for over 20 years, from 1986 to 2007. And this unlawful act, these actions were investigated and brought to light by an ordinary citizen, Tina Cross, whose courage and tenacity helped bring this atrocity to the attention of the public and to my attention. And after I wrote a letter to then Administrator Lisa Jackson in 09, 20, April 2009, calling for a federal investigation, U.S. EPA played a crucial role uh, by working with the Justice Department to execute search warrants and to commence raids on government facilities in order to uh, under the full extent of these appalling criminal acts. Due largely to the U.S. EPA's role just last month, on April 29, 2013, Crestwood officials, including this water department supervisor and the certified water operator, were found guilty of lying about covertly mixing contaminated well water into the village's drinking water supply, and now they are facing lengthy prison sentences as a result of their shameful actions abusing the public trust. Mr. Chairman, I can't do anything but applaud uh, Acting Administrator, Administrator uh, Pusha Sefi, former Administrator J Jackson, and all the other hardworking individuals over at the EPA. They've done a fine job, and they've done in this instance and in other instances. They've done the job that the American people expect them to do, and that is to protect the American people's health, protect their uh, public safety, and protect the environment. And Mr. Purchasepi, I want to thank you and your agency for some outstanding work. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the chairman of the Environment and Economy Subcommittee, Mr. Shimkus, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome Acting Administrator Person Chepsky here. Um, Bob, I didn't see you at baseball practice this morning. We did talk a little baseball yesterday, but we were out there at 630, so uh, we missed you. Uh, but thanks for coming uh, to this uh, oversight hearing on the budget. Um, there's a lot of things we're going to want to know and, and follow and uh, especially what the agency is doing as core statutory authorized programs, whether it's sticking to, uh, sticking to congressional tent or whether it's whether hardworking American tax dollars are being used to appropriately, effectively, and efficiently protect against significant risk to human health and the environment based on the best available and valid science and that these laws are enforced fairly and effectively. Uh, fairly and effectively is in vogue right now as we see issues of other agencies. In fact, tomorrow the subcommittee uh, that I chair will be holding a legislative hearing on small changes to the Superfund, which we sort of addressed yesterday. This law was enacted to clean up the most hazardous waste sites in America, yet after almost 33 years, more than 1,300 sites and billions of dollars spent, less than 37 percent of these sites have been completely cleaned up. And of course, that's not acceptable. We're glad for the, the ones that have been totally cleaned up, but there's still many remaining. Just doing things a certain way because that's how we've always done them is not a viable excuse. We need to do a better job. We need to recognize advancements in technology, reward innovation, cut red tape, and leverage the expertise of state regulators. Case in point is e-manifest, and I'm pleased Congress was finally able to get these changes into law last year, and I applaud the agency's budget for committing resources to its usage. We should not stop there, and I'm also encouraged by the greater use of the Internet and other e-technologies to modernize EPA reporting programs, 
including the guidance supporting consumer confidence reporting under the Safe Drinking Water Act. On the other hand, I do not believe this is the time for EPA to, to launch new programs when there is clear evidence that must focus on its legally mandated responsibilities and doing a better job on them within the current budget climate. I want to know more about how EPA wants to use newer technologies to transform existing systems, the AG, agency's capitalization goals for drinking water state revolving fund and whether we are getting closer to a sustainable SRF program and the specific timeline for EPA before released integrated risk information system assessments have fully, not partially, implemented the important National Academy of Sciences recommendations. I appreciate EPA, EPA styles itself as a science agency, but its deployment on that science should not be beyond reproach. Unfortunately, external review boards have repeatedly called this science into question to truly protect the public from harm as well as unnecessary negative economic outcomes, we need an unbiased, valid process educating policymakers about the science, not policymakers dictating that science. Again, I want to thank you for coming, for being in the committee today. I hope uh, you and the EPA will uh, welcome our oversight efforts as a way to openly inform Congress and American people about the agency's efforts and all its activities. And I want to end by saying um, there's We've developed a pretty good relationship with some folks in the EPA on legislation. We look forward to continuing to do so in the future. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, who's ranking on the subcommittee on, on uh, environment and the economy, recognizing for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Chair Whitfield and Chair Shimkus, for holding this hearing on the Environmental Protection Agency's budget request for 2014. And welcome, uh, Acting Administrator uh, Perciusepi. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has brought us a long way since it was established by President Nixon in 1970. Congress has enacted environmental laws to protect our water, our air, our soil, and food supply. And EPA has implemented them. Public health and a clean environment are inextricably linked. Our economy and our population have grown considerably over the past four decades, demonstrating that environmental protection is compatible with economic growth. In fact, if we are willing to make investments in vital environmental infrastructure, such as drinking water treatment and delivery, source water protection, sewage treatment, and waste to energy systems, we can create thousands of jobs and improve the conditions of our rivers, our lakes, and our coastlines. If we do not make these investments, we risk damaging the resources that we require to support a healthy, modern society. Thoughtless policies like sequestration that blindly cut programs with no regard to their benefit or impact on the public, the environment, or the economy will not put our fiscal house in order and can cause extreme damage. Our failure to repair vital infrastructure infrastructure and to address the complex challenge of climate change has already cost us a great deal. Infrastructure does not repair itself, and the pace and impact of climate change are increasing. We need to address these issues now before the costs rise even further. The administration and the Congress should work together to ensure that we maintain and improve upon our record of environmental protection. EPA's budget is an important part of that effort, and I look forward to your testimony here, um, Ad Administrator Perciusepi, and uh, to working with you and the agency to continue our progress in environmental protection. We have a uniqueness here to uh, that agency. We have in tremendous mission statements associated with it, and we have an economy to grow. So I look forward to, uh, again, working with you and the professionals at EPA. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. At this time, I recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, for, five min uh, for three minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to begin by acknowledging and applauding the success of our nation's efforts to protect and improve our environment over the years. Under existing regs, our air quality has improved dramatically. In fact, this is something that our entire country should be proud of. EPA reports that total emissions of toxic air pollutants decreased by about 42% between 1990 and 2005, then between 1980 and 2010, 
Total emissions of the six principal air pollutants dropped by 63%. However, with that success, some might even say, in spite of it, the number of scope of EPA regs is, is continuing to grow without precedent. Uh, this administration is seeking to regulate where they failed to legislate, and they are doing so still at a furious pace. According to our staff's review, the agency issued over 600 final rules in 2012, bringing the four-year total to more than 2,000. Even more striking than the number of new rules is their unaffordable cost. A recent draft uh, by OMB noted that a disproportionate number of the federal government's costliest regs, in fact, come from the EPA, especially its air office. Rules costing at least a billion dollars are no longer uncommon, and the nation's struggling economy sadly has to absorb them. And while the cost and expansiveness of EPA rules has increased, the level of transparency about those rules appears to have diminished. Even the billion-dollar rules are issued with more questions and answers, and sometimes that final rule is a big departure from the proposed version. Sometimes the underlying scientific justification is considered confidential and not disclosed. Frequently, the cost data is incomplete, and the claim benefits are speculative and poorly supported. And quite often, the regulated community is not given sufficient guidance as to how they can comply. And while the administration is aggressively pursuing regulations within its own jurisdiction, it is also extending its reach beyond. It's continuing to ramp up its greenhouse gas regs, which have the potential to change the way that we power our grid by limiting fuel diversity as well as how we permit new industrial facilities. Another unwelcome example is the agency's 11th hour effort to needlessly delay the keystone approval process and the jobs that Landmark Project would create. I feel that the consequence of EPA's aggressive regulatory expansion for job creation and energy prices, and especially a disproportionate burden on low-income households, that's why I supported the Energy Consumers Relief Act, which would put energy policy back in the hands of the agency with energy in its name, the Department of Energy, by giving DOE the lead role in reviewing all energy-related EPA rules that have, in fact, a billion-dollar price tag. EPA does have an important role in, in, uh, to play in implementing the Clean Air Act and other federal environmental statutes in doing so in the manner that Congress envisioned. So I hope that this hearing is the first step towards getting the agency on that course. And I yield back. This time I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman of uh, California, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Acting Administrator uh, Persepi, uh, thank you for being here today and for your service to the nation at the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA is making our air safer to breathe, our water safer to drink. The agency is on the front line effort to address climate change. It's a huge responsibility and one that all Americans are counting on you to carry out. I want to take this opportunity to urge you to do everything you can to control carbon pollution. Many different sources and activities contribute to this problem and we'll not be able to address it unless we make reductions across the board. Power plants, of course, are the largest source of emissions, but so are major sources like methane from coal mines and oil and gas production. You need to find a way to address all major sources. Despite the critical importance of your work, the EPA budget represents a tiny portion of overall federal spending. Under the President's proposal for fiscal, fiscal year 2014, EPA funding would be less than one quarter of one percent of the federal budget, and EPA would share almost 40 percent of these funds with the states and tribes to help them implement federal environmental laws and achieve national goals. But today we're going to hear that the agency's budget is too big. We'll be told that we can't afford to invest in clean air, clean water, or safe climate. These extreme positions are endorsed by some very big polluters, but they aren't supported by the American people. American families want clean air, clean water. They don't want their health put at risk by exposure to toxic chemicals. They want their children and future generations to be protected from catastrophic climate change. We've just crossed the climate threshold. For the first time since humans have lived on our planet, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide have surpassed 400 parts per million. Scientists tell us we urgently need to act, but you wouldn't know that from this committee because our committee won't let the scientists come in and testify. Republicans, since they took over the House of Representatives, 
uh, this committee, which has primary jurisdiction over the climate issue, has refused to hear from scientists about why climate change is so serious. We need environmental policies that are based on the best science, not ideology. We need an EPA that has enough funds to ensure we keep our moral obligation to future generations. One quarter of one percent of our budget is not too much to spend on clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. In fact, it's clearly not enough. We need to spend the money. We need to make the commitment. We need to do the job, despite those who would like us to uh, abandon that effort and give in to the polluters and let uh, fossil fuels of coal and oil rule the day uh, and uh, cause uh, problems for the future. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. That uh, concludes the opening statements, and so, uh, Mr. Perciuseppe, we appreciate once again your being with us today, and uh, at this time I'll recognize you for five minutes for your uh, statement. Chairman Simpkinson, Whitfield, thank you so much. Um, Ranking Members Rush and Tonko, thank you also for your comments, and the member, the Ranking and, and Chair of the Would you mind moving the microphone just a little closer? Sorry. I think I, think I got the button on, but I guess I got to get closer. Um, well, I was just thanking all the Ranking Members and Chairman that were here, um, if people didn't hear that. And um, if, if you invite me, I will come. <laughs> um, thank you for having this hearing on our on our 2014 fiscal year budget. As you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, 8.153 billion. Um, this is to invest uh, in clean air and clean water, um, clean land. These are uh, pretty important uh, responsibilities EPA has has been given to us by Congress. But we've also spent quite a bit of time on this budget looking at how we can be more efficient, how we can start uh, looking at different ways to manage our work. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking about some of those during the course of our questions and answers. Um, I just want to run through a couple of quick highlights here so we can get on with the questions and answers. And first, I think it's already been mentioned, the significant amount of our budget that is our grant, that our grant funds uh, for both infrastructure and state environmental uh, work um, and despite the fiscal challenges we we face we've maintained uh, those uh, those funds in this budget uh, and we've been able to increase the programmatic grants to the states by a slight amount in this in this budget which is pretty important when you look at the spread of the responsibility for conducting the environmental work of the country the, the mix between uh, e the federal and the, and the state budgets and work we've also requested uh, a $60 million uh, kickstart to uh, a program that we call E-Enterprise at EPA. And I, I appreciated uh, Chairman Simkus talking about the, um, uh, the E-Manifest program that this committee and, and others and, and, and the chairman in particular helped uh, get through the Congress uh, last year. We manage all the movement of hazardous waste in the country through paper. I, I used to think it was the pink and the blue and the yellow, you know, uh, carbon copies. And what we're asking for in funds in this budget is to be able to start the process of getting that into something as ubiquitous in our lives these days as how L.L. Bean or, or anybody else moves their, their, um, their merchandise around. So we'll be able to use uh, electronic means and scanners to be able to keep track of the waste. But, but more importantly on E enterprise is really looking at it's not some big computer system it's really looking at the business model of operating an agency that interacts with the public interacts with the regulated community interacts with the states in a way that we can conduct more of that business through the modern technology that is available today and uh, we believe that that will increase transparency increase compliance it will re reduce uh, errors in data transfer and it will re result in widespread savings. We think the e-manifest system, for instance, and I know that this has been testimony before the committee when you worked on the bill last year or uh, in the last Congress, uh, we, we expect uh, over time to be able to sp save at least $100 million to the regulated community on that part of it alone. We also have $176 million to support some, the work we're doing on greenhouse gases. This not only includes 
uh, cost-effective and common sense uh, rulemaking like the, um, the automobile uh, standards that were mentioned earlier uh, to reduce uh, that we did with the Department of Transportation, but also programs that are tried and true and have had great effect uh, like Energy Star, the greenhouse gas reporting system, and Smart Way, which we do with the American trucking industry to look at ways to reduce the fuel and increase the fuel economy and therefore decrease the emissions from long-haul trucks. Nutrient pollution in water is a major issue uh, confronting the country on a number of fronts, and we have in part of our state grant request $15 million to help the states get a jump start on, on, on moving forward with more work on, on, the, um, on that issue of nutrient pollution in water. We also have um, provided funds in, in the President's budget for the revolving funds. Uh, there's $1.1 billion for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and $817 million for the Drinking Water uh, SRF. But equally important in that program is work we're doing with cities and states to look at an integrated planning at the municipal level to look at not only the most cost-effective approaches to solving problems there, but also how you work on different types of pollu water pollution problems at the same time so that you can uh, find the most cost-effective way. So stormwater and sewer problems, trying to work on those together in an integrated planning approach. So not only are we looking at how much funding we need, but also we're looking at how we might be able to reduce the cost and the, and the life cycle costs over the long haul. We have $1.34 billion for land cleanup. This is Superfund super and, um, and brownfields programs. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, would you uh, get the committee in order so the, the yeah, acting minister can be heard? I'm almost done, Mr. Chairman, um, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to be quick here. Uh, there's also uh, $686 million for um, uh, our work on chemicals from pesticides to chemicals in commerce. Uh, you know, we uh, provide labeling for all the pesticides in use. We also have a number of savings that we've put in this budget and, um, and uh, moved some of those funds uh, out of the budget completely and some in to, to help fund some of these other uh, uh, programs I was mentioning. Uh, there are over 20 EPA programs where we reduced the, the, reduced the budget by over 10 percent. And finally, I'll just mention, uh, in addition to the looking at more electronic tools and uh, looking at programs that might be uh, reduced, we're also looking at our space issues. We're, we've reduced our our space uh, footprint already over the last four or five years, six years, by about 400,000 square feet of space that we're in around the country, and we're looking to continue that process as modern office design and modern laboratory uh, design will uh, move us in that, in that direction. We, we have already uh, saved almost $6 million a year in energy costs by reducing some of these spaces. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, we, we have a, a balanced approach here that's looking at not only maintaining the programs, but also at looking at how we become more efficient for the long haul, recognizing what we all know about uh, the funding issues that confront the, the nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Purchasepi, thanks uh, very much for your statement. At this time, we'll go into uh, questions and answers, and I recognize myself for five minutes for questions to begin with. Uh, first comment I'd like to make relates to sort of an administrative issue, and that is that last year uh, when the administrator came to testify about the budget, we had submitted a number of questions uh, that we, we, we wanted to be answered as we worked with appropriators and others trying to make some final decisions about budget numbers and so forth. And unfortunately, it took EPA nearly 11 months to respond to our questions. And so I would just ask your commitment uh, that you work with us on the questions we're going to be submitting after this hearing, and hopefully maybe we could get an answer within three months or so instead of 11. So would you agree to work with us on that? Um, you, you have my commitment, Mr. Chairman, and I think we all recognize that the, the budget windows are tighter than they, than they normally have been uh, on top of what you suggested. So I, I will make sure that we put the effort necessary so that you have answers to your questions in the time frame that's going to be appropriate for you to work with the appropriators. Thank you very much. And as you know, uh, EPA has a proposed greenhouse gas new source performance standard. 
And uh, if that rule, as proposed, became final, uh, it would be impossible to build a new coal power plant in America because the technology is simply not available to meet the emission standard. And as far as I know, we would be the only country in the world where you cannot build a new coal power plant. And by the way, I read the other day that in Europe, they're getting ready to build 69 gigawatts of new coal power plants in Europe. Uh, so with our demand increasing electricity, I would ask, number one, is EPA going to repropose uh, this rule? Um, we're, we're, we're still in the process of looking at all the comment we got on that. A lot of the comment was in the, in the, uh, in the vein that you're talking about here, Mr. Chairman, that, that what technologies are out there now for coal plants or oil-fired plants or natural gas plants. So um, we haven't made that kind of a decision at this time. We're still in the process of looking at what the framework might be. Well, i tell you what, I think it's going to be extremely difficult for the American people to accept the fact that a plant at Texarkana, Arkansas that opened up in December of last year with the best available technology that it would not be able to meet the emission standards set in this proposed rule. And to believe that a country our size with the electricity demands that we have, cannot build a coal plant using the best available control technology is almost uh, unbelievable to me and many other people. And I would ask the question also, it's the first time that I'm aware of that EPA ever set an emission standard uh, using one fuel source that would be applicable to another fuel source. I would ask the question, what is the legal the justification for doing that? Um, I think I, the, the, the legal framework for that was laid out in the rule that was proposed, but I, 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 this may sound a little repetitive, and I really apologize, because we are looking at that issue as, along with all the other issues that have been brought up on this rule, and, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to still require going through some interagency review process at the federal level. So we, um, we are looking at that particular issue. We're looking at the other issue you mentioned. Um, and I, I want to be clear to the committee that we are not yet done figuring out how to, to finalize that rule. Well, I know that uh, the agency is no stranger to lawsuits, and I know that probably there will be lawsuits filed, whatever, but one of the most contentious parts of this is the fact that uh, you have this admission standard that, that is applicable to more than one fuel source. And so I hope that you all will continue to look at that very seriously. Now. It's bad enough not being able to build a new coal power plant, but uh, do you all have plans to set greenhouse gas standards for existing coal power plants or, or power plants? Well, we, I, we don't currently have the plan for uh, existing plants because we have to finish the, uh, what the performance standards would be for new plants uh, of electric generating uh, facilities. I, I think the Contextually, we should recognize that uh, the two largest sources of greenhouse gases in the United States are the vehicles and, and electric generation. And so it is pretty logical uh, for the agency to be looking at those sources uh, at the onset on how we would manage it. I would note, in addition to uh, some of the points that you're making that need to continue to be looked at, that the Alliance for uh, clean, the Alliance to Save Energy uh, recently came out a report that looked at how energy efficiency and energy productivity could actually significantly reduce greenhouse gases just by us being better at using the, uh, using the electricity and, and fuel for cars that we have. So there are many different options here going forward, and, and I want to make sure that you all know that. Well, my time has expired, but I am going to be submitting a question to you relating to the Navajo Generating Station in Arizona, of which I think there are some real serious issues with. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. Thank you. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pershusefi, uh, as I stated in my opening statement, I want to commend you and your agency for the work you all do on behalf of the American people, protecting our air quality, protecting our land, and protecting our water quality. 
And as you are well aware, the EPA's budget has been a favorite target of my Republican colleagues who can't uh, disband the agency as some of them will prefer. So they are overly and excessively critical of EPA. But I want you to be assured that there are millions of Americans who depend on your agency to be the stewards of the public health and the protectors of our, envir of our environment. But once again, your resources are being depleted with the President's FY 2014 budget, which requests a $325 million decrease or a 3.8% reduction from the enacted level of FY 2013 and a $296 million decrease or 3% or 3.5% decrease from the enacted level for 2012. In fact, uh, Mr. Purchasepi, the President's current request is lower than the FY 2004 enacted uh, level. And these uh, reductions are being, will be felt uh, by my constituents, such as those in Crestwood uh, and in other places throughout the nation. And sometimes they will be felt at the level of life and death. Uh, and uh, these are critical reductions. Uh, I'd like to know that uh, I'm concerned about many issues, but one issue that I'm primarily concerned about, or two of the issues, are one, uh, poor people in general, uh, minority communities, and how given your reductions, uh, how do you strategize to deal with the issues of minorities and poor people in, term, in terms of uh, keeping their standard uh, of uh, quality, air quality, water quality, and other uh, e environmental issues, uh, keeping them in check or at bay, and I would like for you to specifically, if you would, respond to uh, this enormous $9.8 million cut to the Brownfields project. Uh, would you please respond to those questions? Um, on, the, on the general question of, of looking at um, the dis disproportionate impacts that pollution has on society, um, this is something that is a, a, a critical interest to EPA, is a critical interest to our state partners, and also city governments, uh, where those are some of the areas where that may occur. And we are working uh, carefully with our state partners to develop tools and, and techniques to do those kinds of analysis. We do one of the key um, key tools we're using now is more robust community involvement in decision making uh, so that we reach out to some of these communities who are not historically involved with the sort of normal government processes. So it's a combination of, of, of outreach improvement and in, uh, analytical tools that we can use to analyze uh, the potential for a, a disproportionate impact on pollution. And we are building these analysis into some of our rulemaking processes so that we can avoid and find ways to mitigate uh, when, those, uh, when those impacts might happen. So uh, it is very much on our mind, and we, and we are very and working. What, what's going to happen to the Brownfields program at EPA, given, your cut, given these drastic cuts to EPA? The, the which program? Brownfields. Brownfields? Well, the Brownfields program, um, is is reduced slightly in this budget from the enact from the enacted 2012, and obviously it was reduced in 2013 by the sequestration process. Um, but uh, it will slow down. It's an oversubscribed program. It's one that brings 
uh, land in, in developed areas that had been used in the past. It brings it back into productive use, uh, sometimes for manufacturing. In fact, that's one of the things we're working on in, a, in an administration-wide manufacturing initiative. Uh, but it also sometimes comes in for other community-related uses. So, yes, the brownfield program is uh, robust. It is uh, in the budget, uh, but it will be at a reduced amount, and so there will be fewer uh, brownfields projects in 2014. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Perchisefi, I'm going to try to get through four questions pretty quick. So, in the, and I kind of gave the intro in the opening statement. So, I'm going to first go to the uh, Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, what are your capitalization goals for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, and are we getting any closer to a sustainable state revolving fund program? Right. When I when I look at, um, I, I think we're always getting closer as long as we can continue to put capitalization grants in the budget. We are staying ahead of inflation, and we're building those funds through the whole country. Um, the last year, the combined revolving funds produced $7.7 .7 billion of, of infrastructure investment because it's made up of the capitalization grant that you all approve, the state match to that grant, the repayments that now are coming in between 3 and $4 billion a year, and the leveraging that states are doing with their funds with mu blending in municipal or, or general, you know, uh, revenue bonds into, into it. So when you mix all of that together, the investment we're making here is, is leveraging because these banks are getting bigger and bigger. Um, I think that this is a, a, a long-term issue we all have to uh, discuss and wrestle with on how, mu how big you want those banks to be before we feel like the federal component is, is there. We think we need to stay ahead of inflation, and we still think we need to be putting some capitalization into those banks. Well, there's, there's a huge uh, need. Yeah, there's a huge need, a lot of interest, a uh, good program. We just, you know, uh, yeah. so that's why I wanted to put my focus on there. Um, I want to also talk about your, the IRIS program and the National Academy of Sciences, and just really just a caution. Um, we'll have these fights here in the dais and in the room on, on science. What is, what is the real science? And it would, I think it would be helpful for the EPA to uh, make sure that uh, w the, the substantive changes are in line with the National Academy of Sciences and that you, you, you hold as close as you can to that because then that takes really a pretty arguable point off the table for anyone if, if we're using that, in essence, a, a clear science-based proposal. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And there's two things going on that I just want to make sure you, you have uh, in your, in your, um, on your table when, when you're thinking about this. First is we've asked the National Academy to sort of look at the progress we're making, and so they're in that process again so we can keep linked up with them. Second, we're we're shortly going to come out with another set of improvements to the program uh, that, we're, w that we've been working on, again, keeping in line with the original National Academy. So we're saying linked with the National Academy to have them keep looking at it as we're making these improvements, and we have another batch uh, coming up. So I, we're, we're very keen on Great. exactly what you're saying. Great. On the e-manifest, would two million be enough for you to get started in fiscal year 14? I think we need a little more than two million. Uh, I know that that's what the authorized uh, amount was. Uh, I think in order to, since we had a, there's a little hop, skip, and a jump here with whatever you want to call 2013. We're, we we need uh, to uh, put a little extra money in there. I don't know the exact amount, but I think we have four, four million. I may, okay, <clears throat> I can get you the precise number, but we have a little bit more in the budget. Great. Uh, well, that's why we ask these questions, that's why, uh, and we'll look forward to working with you and we'll, we'll evaluate that. Now, 4.4 is in the budget. The, the last uh, part of my line of question really deals with uh, um, kind of a local interest to this past April press reports indicated and you all confirmed that had released personal identifying information for thousands of farmers and ranchers. What recourse do the folks have whose information was leaked? Um, we have no evidence that any of the information was leaked. Uh, we've been, I think we've been able to... But you uh, confirmed that, it, that the information was... I mean, you all confirmed... We've already... Uh, you know, we got that information from the states. 
Um, I think uh, it was released uh, without uh, the uh, appropriate review that it needed to have, and uh, we've now done that review several times over, and uh, I'm pretty confident that where we are now is, 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 in, is in good shape. However, we've, we've been working with the people who received it, both in the ad community and in the uh, in the NGO community to, to not release and change back uh, the information. Let me ask a final question. Uh, were any of the FOIA processing fees waived by EPA for this request for information? And if so, on what grounds? And if you don't have that at, yeah. in, available, if you could let me know, I would appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll have to, um, you know, the sequestration sort of cut across everything, right. but um, I, I can get you the precise great, information. Great, thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. At this time, I recognize uh, Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Administrator uh, Purchisepi, uh, again, thank you for your leadership. Um, EPA is required to conduct a drinking water infrastructure survey every four years and to produce a report to Congress summarizing the survey results. That last report was delivered, as you know, in 2009. Is the agency on track to complete its report sometime this year? I, I believe we are. I know that it's in, uh, it's in the final stages of review. I, I, I'm saying I don't see a reason that it won't get done this year. Thank you. And the 2009 report indicated a need for investments of over $300 billion over the next two decades, an average of about $16 billion per year. Uh, that's to maintain safe drinking water for our citizens. I'm concerned that with budget cuts and the sequester that we are falling even farther behind in maintaining these vital systems. And when you consider situations like those we in New York have experienced with Hurricanes Irene, Lee, and Sandy, the need to harden these systems or redesign them creates yet another um, bit of additional challenge. Uh, how have the revolving loan funds that provide support for this work fared under the current sequestration? Are, are we going to be able to meet the needs of hurricane-impacted areas? Um. Well, uh, in terms of the hurricane-impacted area, we had a separate appropriation for Superstorm right. Sandy, uh, which was around $600 million. It did get trimmed by the sequestration. Um, but I want to say that the appropriations uh, to deal with that storm and its aftermath are not only in EPA. They're also in the, the Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, and in, and in HUD. And it's... The, what we're working on very hard with the states, uh, and we have very good connection with the states and very good interagency coordination at the federal level, is how those funds can work together. So the FEMA funds can look, I mean, simplistically, can look to rebuild things to the way they were. The HUD funds could be used to extend beyond the, the sewage treatment plant itself and look at some of the infrastructure coming in and as they're looking at neighborhood and community rehabilitation. And we can look to the EPA funds, which are small comparatively to those other ones, as to how you make resiliency improvements at the facilities themselves, you know, elevating pumps or flood-proofing uh, electronic uh, boxes and improving the uh, emergency backup power system. So I think we're in good shape for the hurricane-damaged areas. Uh, in terms of the overall needs of the Safe Drinking Water Program for the United States, you know, that mix of federal funds and local funds is something that is a constant back and forth because if, if you look at just the federal funds, it looks like it will be a long time before we would meet those needs. So we really have to look at what the local bonding authorities are and funding as well as the federal together. Uh, there's still uh, not enough uh, to do these things in the 20-year time frames that are looked at in the needs surveys. However, we're also looking at how we can reduce costs you know, find more cost-effective ways to do it, like green infrastructure. I'm sorry that's a long answer to your question. Well, no, I appreciate that. But the uh, $16 billion per year, you believe, is something that's, that we're falling short of in terms of any of the creative financing that we could come up with? Well, certainly the federal government isn't covering $15 billion a year. Um, but the other sources that are out there, including things like the Rural, Udo rural Utility Service in, in the Department of Agriculture and Army Corps of Engineers and others, as well as the local funding, I don't have the number whether it's at that level for the, uh, uh, across the country. And in terms of facing significant costs, is that not the case if drinking water systems are deficient? I mean, there's an impact here that uh, we can't escape. 
If and they're not up to date? If they're not up to date, yeah. if there's delayed response? Well, the longer you delay maintenance and, and capital upgrades, which is obviously part of the needs, the ongoing capital upgrade, they, they, it can cost more in the future. You know, if you don't keep the pipes and the pumping stations and everything up to date uh, or replaced in a proper time, you know, it's just like bridges and any other infrastructure, eventually it costs more to fix them in the future. So it is important that we continue focusing on this at the national level to make sure that we have funds to do that. Mm -hmm. And obviously the states would have to make up this difference, which is a huge impact. Well, states and or local governments are often the ones that are funding uh, these water infrastructure projects. Right. Has anyone quantified jobs as they relate to these sort of projects? Yes, we, we, we do look at the jobs. And in fact, when we did the Recovery Act, there was a $6 billion influx into these funds. Uh, and we have the, I don't have them here with me, but we have the, the calculations of the jobs created by, uh, by that, which is a good indicator of the jobs that are created. But in the last four years, we've put almost 20 billion, a little over $20 billion into these revolving funds, which, is, uh, which has been a, a boost to getting ahead a little bit. Okay. So thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Yeah, I was on the phone a little bit earlier. My hometown was hit by a tornado last night, and uh, my staff was downtown and giving me a report on the damage. We had millions of dollars of damage. Uh, the tornado hit approximately a mile from my home in my uh, congressional office, but uh, at least in, in Ennis, Texas, nobody was injured. We did have at least six deaths uh, in, the, in the area. So that's, that's why I was on the phone um, getting that report. Um, we appreciate you being here, sir, as the acting administrator. Um, we have a, a new tradition that we allow people out in the country to Twitter in questions for members to ask. And uh, we've gone through some of them. And uh, we have a question from a constituent of mine, actually. Crow Dagnon Man, C-R-O-D-A-G-N-O-N-M-A-N, Crow Dagnon Man, if I'm saying that right. Uh, he's referring to a Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, story that some uh, some research has been done uh, comparing the uh, request to have uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, fees waived. And they did a, a, a review of some of the requests and found that uh, uh, left of center groups seem to have a very good chance to have their fee request approved, while uh, right of center groups had almost no chance he looked at uh, some information for the last year, said that uh, from January 2012 to this spring, the National Resource Defense Council, Sierra Club, Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, Earth Justice, had their fees waived in 75 out of 82 cases. Meanwhile, the Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, was rejected 14 out of 15 times. Uh, the Sierra Club, um, had had um, 11 of their 15 requests approved. The NRDC had had 19 out of 20 approved. Earth Justice uh, was perfect. Uh, got all 19 requests approved. Uh, employees for Environmental Responsibility went a perfect 17 for 17. Um, Waterkeeper Alliance had all three of its requests granted. Greens Peace and the Southern Environmental Law Center were two for two and Center for Biological Diversity were four for four. We've just seen the scandal that's erupted over the IRS targeting uh, the conservative groups um, for audits and things like that. Uh, what's your response to something that seems to be of a similar nature happening at EPA? And uh, do you, as the acting administrator, will you investigate this? And if it needs to be corrected, promise to correct it? Um. Thank you uh, for that question. And yes, this came to my attention uh, yesterday, I think, as it did to a number of folks. I had an opportunity to talk to the chairman very, very briefly yesterday about it. Um, and I have not read uh, yet personally the report that you're bringing up. But I want to assure the committee that it is not uh, EPA's policy in any way, shape, or form to treat people differently when they request to be waived for fees. Um, and we have six criteria 
that I looked at last night uh, that we use to make those deter that the staff uses to make those determinations. Um, we do. I've also discovered since the last time we talked, Mr. Chairman, uh, that we do about 500 of these a year. So um, what I've asked uh, this morning is that our Inspector General uh, help me do a programmatic audit of this. Uh, I don't know if these criteria are causing uh, any problem or whether or not these, this kind of decision making uh, 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 that, uh, that is pointed out in this report is actually what's happening. And so I need to, I need to get that uh, unbiased uh, opinion on this. I should point out that even if the fees are not waived, it's, in, it's frequent that fees aren't charged anyway because a certain amount of the work we do is free regardless. And with our new uh, FOIA online system, there's no, um, there's no duplication fees because some of the fees used to be in copying all the materials and now it's all electronic. So even, even if uh, somebody's uh, request is denied for whatever reason, um, the chance of them having to pay any fees are much lower today than they used to be. That said, I'm, go I'm going to look forward well, it, to getting you know, an audit of this. We can have disagreements on, on policy and we can have disagreements over the implications, but to people out in the public, if it's government information and you're going to give it free to one side, you ought to be able to also provide it free to the other and then let, let yeah. the policymakers and the public make the decision. And it, it, it certainly appears uh, that there's a bias uh, when, it, when if you're the Sierra Club, it's almost a guarantee your fees will be waived. And if, if you're the Competitive Enterprise Institute, it's almost a guarantee your fees are not going to be waived. Well, as I said, I'm, I'm going to get an independent look at all of that information so I can make a determination. So I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, I, I've been uh, looking at this over the last 24 hours a little bit. Thank Gentlemen's time has expired at this time. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this hearing is uh, supposed to focus on the President's fiscal year 2014 budget request for the EPA. How, however, first we need to understand the immediate impact of sequestration uh, that will, uh, what it will have on the agency's ability to protect public health this year. Earlier this year, EPA provided an assessment of the sequester's pot potential impact across the agency, and I'd like to explore how this is actually playing out, Mr. Perciuseppe. One expected effect was to slash funding for states to monitor local air quality and provide the public with essential air quality data. Administrator Perciuseppe, are these reductions still expected to occur, and what will that mean for states and communities? Um, the, all the, all the we, we call it the state tribal assistance grants uh, pro, uh, budget uh, program in the, in the agency, all of those were, were cut by 5%. Uh, there was no discretion uh, on our part on that. So the purposes of those grants and the, um, and the activities that they were going to conduct I have that level of, of reduction, in, including uh, air quality monitoring programs. Will it make a difference? Should we be concerned about it? What will, what will be the impact? Um, well, on, on air quality specifically or on the grants in general? Uh, I'm sorry. The, the, well, I mean, on the, on the, on the, even the Sandy supplemental we were just talking about was reduced by 5%. The drinking water revolving fund will probably result in 40 fewer projects uh, started during, during the year. Um, the, the purchasing of air quality monitors under that section of the Clean Air Act will, will just be stretched out longer. There's so this is money the states and local monitor air quality uh, efforts will be reduced. We, they just won't know what's going on to the full extent that they're now able to with the funds that are going to be cut. Will the agency still have to significantly reduce inspections and other compliance and enforcement activities? Yes, we have a, a combination of issues there because our travel budgets are cut, but also we have to furlough employees. So when we're furlough employees, obviously that translates into fewer hours available to do the inspections. Our, our, our estimate is a, probably around 1,000 fewer inspections and that we haven't translated it down to the fewer inspections the states will do if they have uh, if their grants which will be uh, reduced well if we uh, if there's not going to be a 
credible possibility of inspections and enforcement, compliance, I would think, would break down. The companies that comply with the law are disadvantaged, creating more incentives to cheat. Is that a fair conclusion? I think it's, I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, some compliance will go undetected. Another EPA initiative at risk are two of the joint EPA-NIH Centers of Excellence for Children Health Research, which research the role of environmental factors in some of the most pervasive and devastating childhood diseases, including asthma, autism, childhood leukemia, and diabetes. Will EPA be forced to stop funding two centers conducting critical research on these childhood diseases? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I'd like I you to get it for me, because that's my that understanding I, that it would happen. You know, all of... I'm also concerned about the assistance EPA gives local communities for conducting cleanups and downgrading and upgrading infrastructure. EPA yep. uh, projected no new Superfund cleanups, slowdowns and ongoing Superfund cleanups, fewer water quality protection and restoration projects, and hundreds of underground storage cleanup projects that will no longer happen. Uh, Administr Administrator Perciusepi, will states still face these substantial cutbacks? We will have uh, fewer brownfields projects, probably about 10 uh, under a cooperative agreement that we have, five fewer cleanups. Um, there'll, be, um, uh, there'll be 12 fewer Superfund uh, removals. Um, these, these just permeate through the whole thing. Well, these we can provide. cuts are irrational. They're going to hinder efforts to protect Americans from radiation after terrorist attack or disaster. They're going to undermine our ability to protect our waters from oil spills. They will weaken efforts to protect our infrastructure against national disasters and nuclear accidents. These cuts are bad for public health and for the economic health of our communities. Uh, they... they uh, they stop good investments for our communities that are labor intensive, which means good jobs for construction workers and engineers. Some of the projected effects would hurt American businesses as well. But the, the key point that I think what we must recognize is that next year's proposed budget cuts under sequestration would be another $325 million from EPA's current funding levels under the sequester. And, of course, the Ryan budget would go further. In 2014, they would cut EPA funding by an estimated 14 percent from 2012 levels. Uh, this is unacceptable. EPA has critical responsibilities, protecting clean air, clean water, slowing devastating climate change. Even if you want to protect your coal industry, it's not a reason enough gentleman's to time cripple is, EPA. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time, right now, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. I want to thank the chairman for hosting this hearing and uh, thank Acting Administrator uh, Perciusepi. Is that you correct? Got it. I appreciate you coming here and, uh, and answering our questions. I know I've got a number. Um, I want to start with a question about ozone standards. In 2010, the EPA had proposed to change the existing ozone standard uh, that had just been put in place in 2008, hadn't yet even been implemented. Um, ultimately, I think the, uh, the standards were estimated to cost between $19 billion and $90 billion annually to our economy, and, uh, and I think they were pulled back, but I know in my district that would, uh, that would bring, uh, bring levels in many of the parishes I represent into non-attainment, non uh, which, uh, which would add tremendous uh, cost and burden onto, uh, to a lot of uh, families and businesses out there. I um, want to ask you, uh, first of all, when you come out with your uh, proposals next year, uh, do you intend to repropose the current standard, or are you looking at doing something similar to what you all had floated out in 2010? Well, um, as you pointed out, um, we are in the process of implementing the current standard that was uh, enacted uh, in 2008. Um, what's going on right now and, and is not completed yet is the, uh, sci the science process that goes on in front of any proposed new standard. And I, I believe the, the schedule has that happening sometime early next year, I think, as you have pointed out, or very close to the end of this year. Right. But right now, the, the, uh, the Clean Air Science Advisory uh, Council is, is in the process of reviewing 
uh, science documents on that. So uh, there's no uh, particular proposal in, in front of the administrator at this point. Will you all be taking public comment on maintaining the current OH standard? Yeah. Yes. If once, the, once that science process is over, they'll, prob I, I'm going to, they'll probably identify you know, a range uh, and that th those will go out for public comment. All right. I want to go back to uh, that Competitive Enterprise Institute report that Congressman Barton was just talking yeah. about. This is the report. Okay. Um, I've gotten a copy of the report to your staff. Okay. It came out earlier this week. It details uh, mm -hmm. some of the FOIA request information that, that you alluded to, clearly, clearly your office is aware about uh, of it because it involves lawsuits that have been going on for years, but ultimately what they've done is compiled a list. They took many left-leaning, whatever many people would consider left-leaning groups, and they took what many would consider right-leaning groups uh, that issue FOIA requests upon the EPA and have the ability to get those fees waived, uh, and they found, and it's, and it's categorized in this report, uh, that 92% of the time, 92% of the time, this goes back to January of 2012 through now, 92% of the time the EPA waived those fees for left-leaning groups, and 93% of the time you denied those same fee waivers to conservative-leaning groups. And so when we take this in the context of what just happened and what's just been exposed at the IRS, where uh, yesterday USA Today's headline was, liberals get a pass. Uh, it seems like at the EPA the same thing is happening where liberals get a pass. And, you know, and if it was just an isolated incident and maybe you can go back and look at a couple of things, uh, that might be one thing. But when you start seeing a culture of, of anti-conservative attitude by the Obama administration, it raises very troubling questions. When you see some of these numbers uh, and you look at the not only the Competitive Enterprise Institute, but also the American Tradition Institute were rejected more than 93% of the time. And then you go look at the, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Sierra Club, I think, uh, what is it, the uh, Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, they were a perfect 17 for 17 at getting their fees waived by y'all. And so after a pattern of this, it's not just a coincidence. And so what I want to know is who makes the decisions at EPA to waive these fees? Th those decisions are made in our FOIA office, which is uh, a, career, a career program office in, in the agency. And they have criteria that they use uh, to make these decisions. And what I mentioned to uh, Mr. Barton, and, and, I'll, and I'll repeat again, it is not our policy to not apply these things. I understand. Formally. Does the assistant administrator, Ms. McCarthy, have any involvement in these fee waivers? No. Okay, let me ask you this, because one other thing that they raised, and this is something that came from uh, the uh, American Tradition Institute, I think there's a separate lawsuit going on, that involves instant messaging, and they're trying to get instant messaging in FOIAs, and it seems like only emails were turned over but not IMs, and I think you even issued a memo recently yeah. reminding your employees uh, that it seems like maybe in the EPA they had been using e it, IMs to try to avoid using emails to try to hide that information from FOIAs. Number one, what are you doing about making sure that instant messages are also included in FOIA requests, but also do you know of any, uh, any uh, history of destroying instant e IMs, uh, those in instant messages, over at the EPA, whether they're destroyed uh, accidentally or in violation of disclosure laws? Um, I can say that the, we just changed our computer system for um, email um, that has a better instant messaging uh, uh, preservation system in it. Uh, to my knowledge, instant messaging is not widely used at EPA. Um, but uh, we are putting in place, as I suggested in my uh, memos uh, the, to the staff and to uh, others, that uh, we are putting in place a, a backup preservation system so that they... Do you know if any have been destroyed? I, not that I can, not that I know of. Thanks. So you'll back... No, no, time 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 Mr. This time I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Thank you for your courtesy. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks in the record and to include certain correspondence between me and EPA, which will be occurring shortly. Uh, Mr. Persiusepi, uh, many of us in the Great Lakes have sent a letter to the Appropriations Committee requesting $300 million for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. The administration has requested that level of funding as well. 
I have concerns that EPA is not doing enough to address the water quality in the Great Lakes. As you know, we had a massive algae growth in Lake Erie, which was in, referred to not long back as America's Dead Sea. Uh, and I've worked long and hard to clean this up, but I note that in the response your office has given, uh, you uh, have reference to resources to combat massive algae blooms such as the one on Lake Erie. I'd like to hear, do you have enough resources to deal with that algae bloom and do you, and do you propose to do anything about it this year so that we don't have another repetition? Um, I, I think it's a... It's yes a, or no? Uh, yes, I have the funding for the I'll EPA ask you to part submit, of this. I'll ask you to submit for the record what you propose to do about that and whether you have adequate funds. Now, I'd appreciate it if you would submit for the record additional information on efforts EPA is taking to address this issue. And so if you could submit that for the record, it would be appreciated. Yes, sir. I have the distinct feeling you do not have the resources to do the job. Now, next question. Uh, I see that the President's fiscal year 2014 budget request for CERCLA, or Superfund, is $33 million less than for fiscal year 2012. Yes or no? Can CERCLA continue to fulfill its duties and its current cleanup responsibilities and obligations without slowing down significantly because of this reduction in funding? Yes or no? Yes for existing Superfund sites. Future ones we're going to have to delay. In other words, you do not have enough money to do the cleanup at the same rate or at the necessary rate because of that cut. Is that right or wrong? Yes. Uh, would you submit some additional information on that, if you please, so that we may evaluate that more, more, more adequately? Now, this is an important issue, given the fact that tomorrow we're going to be having a hearing on amending CERCLA. I am concerned again about something different that, about which you have no say, and that is the majority, majority appears not to be allowing the minority to request certain witnesses. Given the complexity of the issues the draft legislation seeks to address, I hope the majority would hold fair and open hearings so that we could have a proper input and in all the information that's needed. Now, I'd like to have you answer this question. Would the gentleman yield on that point? I'll be happy to yield. Um, the, the fact of the matter is we were asked by the ranking member on the floor. Uh, the, the hearing tomorrow has three Republican witnesses and two Democrat witnesses. Then we were asked for government witnesses, which you said we would have at a, a, well, a, a additional time. So I don't know what this, this frustration is, but it's very disappointing because it's not the intent in both government agencies we're not going to testify are we, on the pending legislation. My question is, are we going to have enough time and enough witnesses to get the answers? These hearings are supposed to afford the minority adequate opportunity to be heard. If the gentleman would yield. That is the case. If the gentleman would yield, the answer is uh, absolutely. All right. Uh, I but I don't know what you all are crying about. That's my frustration. Well, I, won't, I only have 44 seconds left. Uh, what is EPA doing to enforce the cost of cleanups and emergency cleanups? Please submit that for the record. And I want you to tell me what is EPA doing to hold the property owners responsible for the costs related to cleanups? We have one situation in my district where the mayors are continuously complaining about the fact that the property owner is being doing nothing and that he is paying fines or is supposed to pay fines of about $37,000 per day for his refusal to carry forward. This individual has a long history of having failed to have done what it is he is supposed to do to comply with a wide array of laws. Uh, I will be sending you a letter which I ask unanimous consent be inserted in the record together with the response about this particular individual and about what you are doing there. And I'm hoping that you will give me an adequate and prompt response. Now. Without objection, then the gentleman's time has expired. And I thank you. Just one more question quick. 
Uh, is EPA doing enough to adequately carry forward existing steps to the highest level of performance, or are you having to cut back because of lack of personnel and money? For emergency cleanups, if I am correct in your question, we, ha we make sure that we have the adequate resource to deal with emergency responses. Uh, this, in this time, the fact that I'm 53 seconds over, time I'm going expired. to request that you submit that for the record. Okay. This time, uh, I'm sorry. And, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and my colleague for your courtesy. We do want to work with the majority. We want to see that we get the time. We want to see that we get the witnesses. And we want to yeah. see that we have a record that gives us the ability to legislate and, uh, properly. Mr. Mr. Perchepe, did you understand the documents that he asked yes. you to? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. And I'm, yeah. we will follow up. Okay. With, with the, Thank you. <laughs> and, Mr. Chairman, I, I like, I'd like you and my other colleague to know that these questions are asked with great, great respect and great affection. Chairman, uh, since the subject came up and uh, Chairman Shimkus raised the question, I believe, for the record, what we would like is a full discussion of the Superfund before the markup of the bills. So if we have other witnesses coming in, which he has been kind enough to grant, um, we believe it would be helpful to do the sequence in that the committee has this additional hearing to which it's committed. Yeah, but if the gentleman, we, the we just marked up the track and trace under, under the FDA, and we didn't have a whole FDA authorization hearing. It's, that, it's right. kind of an irresponsible request. This is a legislative hearing. We can have a hearing on the Superfund on, it, on its own. But to, but to say you have to have a full hearing on a full agency before you move on a hearing on legislative, legislation is, is, is those, problematic. In, in those other areas, though, Chairman, I would suggest that you've had hearings. There has not been a Superfund hearing in some 10 years, no. with many committee members being new to this committee since that time. And I think it would be very helpful to have that sort of understanding of how Superfund is working or not working before we amend and to do that before the markup of the bills. Well, listen, uh, I, I'm sure you and Mr. Shimkus can work this out for your subcommittee. At this time, I'm recognizing the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> thank you for the recognition. Uh, Mr. Uh, Perciusepi, I'm going to ask you to get very close to the, to the microphone, if you will. I'm uh, suffering from swimmer's ear this morning, and I can hardly hear my own self-talk. I don't know whether I'm yelling or speaking softly, so uh, bear with me. Uh, I would like to thank the, the acting administrator for testifying at today's joint hearing on the fiscal year 2014 budget. Uh, I'll get right to my questions. Mr. Perciusepi, in your capacity as acting administrator or as deputy administrator, have you ever solicited money from the stakeholders which your agency supervises? Yes or no? No. You personally. Have you ever suggested, requested, or otherwise asked stakeholders your agency supervises to donate money or otherwise assist in implementing a law for which your agency is responsible? Yes or no? No. Have you ever suggested, requested, or otherwise asked state, stakeholders your agency supervised to donate money to or otherwise assist outside groups that share your goals for implementing your agency's laws? Yes or no? No. Well, I, I appreciate uh, those responses, and I'm glad to hear that because, as you may be aware, no doubt, this past Friday, the Washington Post reported that, that HHS Secretary, Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, has for the last three months been making phone calls to health industry executives asking that they contribute to nonprofit groups working to implement various aspects of the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. In fact, the New York Times then reported on Sunday that Secretary Sebelia suggested that they support the work of Enroll America, a nonprofit organization that indeed is advocating for Obamacare. Mr. Chairman, I am pleased by the acting administrator's answer 
that the EPA has not acted in this manner. However, in light of the indiscretions, and my colleague from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, touched on this, he, he stole my thunder, but not my lightning. Uh, the, these indiscretions admitted this week across multiple Mr. agencies. Mr. Chairman. Read the Department of Justice or the Department Mr. of Chairman. Treasury. Uh, I Would am gentleman extremely yield? concerned. Would a gentleman yield? No, I, I, I will not. I'll, I, if I have time at the end, I'll be glad to yield, but I will not yield now. I am extremely concerned with conduct of this, this executive branch. It, it is abundantly clear, it's abundantly clear that each agency has significant power over the very industries that they regulate. I expect these subcommittees of Energy and Commerce, this one, will continue to utilize their oversight of this administration to monitor agencies and ensure that the private sector has the ability to create jobs and bolster our economy without the threat of retribution. And that's what we're facing right now. And I'll yield to any of my colleagues on this side uh, at this point the rest of my time, or else I'll Mr. yield Mr. back Chairman. my time. Or I'll yield a few, a few uh, 30 seconds to the gentleman from uh, Chicago. Mr. Chairman. I'm sure he knows I'm a lot sure, about I'm this. Sure, I'm sure uh, this, my friend has outrage about a whole lot of matters, but. Uh, we can all have uh, voice our sense of outrage by a lot of matters. But why waste the time of the members of the committee on such far-reaching and, and uh, inappropriate uh, feigned outrage because you want to attack the Obama administration? This has been a, 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 a orderly hearing. It's been a hearing conducted with some decency. And out of the blue, come these outrageous, ill time and ill-conceived remarks. Mr. Chairman, let us keep our committee, the Energy and, and, and Power Subcommittee, has a record, has a way of keeping proper demeanor between the individuals. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Reclaiming my time, I, I now yield Chairman back. Thank an you, apology. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, you I think he owes an, an apology. Mr. Rush, let me just say. You're wasting our time. I would just say that the gentleman from Georgia actually complimented EPA for not in, involving themselves in those kinds of things. Mr. Chairman, you, we have been uh, abused in this hearing by the gentleman from Georgia. Abused. This time I would recognize the gentleman from California, Ms. Capps, for five minutes. Thank the chairman for recognizing me, and I thank you, Mr. Berchiseppe, for your testimony. I appreciate EPA's knowledge, acknowledgement of the strong link between our energy sources and usage, climate change, and clean air and water. As a representative of a coastal district, I am particularly mindful of these impacts on our oceans. As you well know, we rely upon healthy oceans for countless economic activities like fishing, tourism, and recreation. One of the most troubling impacts of climate change is ocean acidification, which threatens countless organisms, ecosystems, and livelihoods. Ocean acidification is caused by the increased uptake of carbon dioxide from the air and nutrient runoff from land. Managing coastal runoff is clearly within EPA's jurisdiction. So I would hope that EPA has a plan for managing this contributor to ocean, ocean acidification. My specific question, Mr. Perciseppi, is, is EPA doing anything to monitor nutrient runoff? If so, what are you doing to reduce this runoff and its impacts on the ocean? Thank you for the, for the question. Um, Nutri I mentioned uh, in my opening comments, and, and I want to um, emphasize this more with your question, that nutrient pollution, whether it be uh, Lake Erie um, or uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes or Lake Tahoe or, or the ocean in bay near, near coastal waters, is a, is a major issue in the United States. We have asked in this budget for some additional funds to help states put together uh, more concrete plans on some of those impaired waters, and we've been working with the states to identify all the places in the country where there is impairment. I want to add one thing very quickly. We've also been working very hard uh, with our partners in the Department of Agriculture because uh, they also have concerns about yeah. this because obviously 
uh, they want to maintain nutrients on the land so that they ha can help grow the crops. So we uh, have a good working relationship there, and we are hoping to provide some more funding to states here through this budget. And I appreciate that, and, and we'll look forward to working with you to, to yeah. make sure this happens. Um, another topic, one of the deeper program cuts in the EPA budget is to the National Estuary Program, which was reduced by nearly 15 percent, and this is compared to the 5.2 percent reduction to the agency as a whole. Our national estuaries, and I can tell you, you know that I have one in my district, are such an important resource for coastal communities through ecosystem preservation and also providing local jobs. Despite these programs' ability to leverage minimal EPA funding, and they partner with such a variety of private sources and nonprofit sources, so they really are good at leveraging, these estuary programs are relatively small, and they can't weather cuts as well as some of the larger programs. For example, Morro Bay National Estuary Program in my district raises about two and a half dollars for every dollars that, dollar it receives from EPA. This program helps our cities, the county, state agencies, local nonprofits, and landowners further the, the conservation goals uh, in our local communities. But this proposed cut is going to force Morro Bay to eliminate a position in that estuary to pull back on promised services to our community. So, Mr. Purgiuseppe, I understand EPA's very tough budget challenges, but what is the rationale for making such a substantial cut to the National Estuary Program, and how does this align with EPA's overall mission? I know it's a tough question. You didn't ask for this budget, uh, but we're trying to uh, understand it. You know, the National Estuary Program is something I've personally worked on for many, many years. Um, uh, being from Baltimore for my, the middle part of my life, um, obviously the Chesapeake Bay is uh, a pretty important, um, um, a pretty important amount. Now, um, what you're talking about is the difficult choices we had to make in implementing the sequestration in 2013. Absolutely. I want you to know that the budget before you for 2014 um, restores um, the funding for the estuary program at, at, the, at the basic level that we think it needs to have. And I, I hope, again, that the committee will, in its advice and co coordination right. with the Appropriations Committee, uh, support that. Thank so, you. So we, I look forward to, to yeah. getting that information. And I did have one other question which won't fit into the last 18 seconds, but it, because it's, it's such a big topic, our country's water infrastructure is in such need of repair and upgrades. So I would like to, Mr. Chairman, submit this question to, to Mr. Purchisepi uh, in written, written form and ask that the, both the committee and myself personally uh, receive a written answer and response because I think we're at a crisis level in many of our water uh, districts in the country. I know we certainly are on the central coast of California. And so, again, thank you for uh, thank you. continuing this uh, uh, back and forth. Thank well, they will certainly be submitted. As you know, when the hearing is over, we'll be gathering material for additional questions and getting it to the administrator. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would first ask the, I would first thank the witness for your statement. If you invite me, I will come. And you stand by that, do you? You're not going to change your mind on that. No, I mean, that's to play baseball. Okay. Uh, the, the, the well, you folks Chairman Simkis said I didn't show up for practice last night, and I said if you invite me, I will come to the next practice. Your, your folks, uh, Gina McCartney and Lisa Jackson, fouled out on all the letters I've written to them, requesting them to come here, and Mrs. Jackson refused to come here until we threatened subpoena. Finally, she agreed to a time under her conditions, she thought. Uh, I sure hate to see you follow something like that. You're so important to us. Mr. Dingle uh, helped write a bill for clean air and clean water back, I don't know, sometime in the 80s, early 90s. Were you with the EPA at that time? I, I was not at the EPA in <coughs> 1990. I was working for Governor Schaefer in, in Maryland in 1990. Well, we at that time set some provisions for EPA to have some control over. I'm from Texas, and I know the oil and gas business, and I know they need some control, need some supervision, some oversight. We set them up to give them that oversight. And also, though, we expected them to give them some support. And that's, and that has been their practice up until 
this administration came into being. Uh, I just, uh, and one time on Gina McCartney, uh, I asked her if she could, did you consider the impact uh, your resolutions have on our jobs? And her answer, and it's in the record here, and they're being made aware of that over there as she seeks to be confirmed, that her answer was, I, I'm not in the business of creating jobs. Well, and I told her I thought that's one of the meanest question, answers I'd ever had here with the problem people are having, not having jobs and having to tell their family they can't provide. And I left her a place to apologize. She's never done that. So I'm, I'm going to really expect you to, to come when we invite you because we want you to. Uh, as you know, EPA recently designated Wise County, Texas, a, a county with significant gas production and transmission as an ozone non-attainment area. You're aware of that, aren't you? It's yes or yes. no, if you know. Yes. And this action was initiated by your former colleague, Mr. Al Armendariz. You remember that name, don't you? Uh, yes, he was a former uh, regional minister. Yes. Uh, and he likened EPA's regulatory enf enforcement philosophy toward the oil and gas industry to Roman crucifixion. Do you remember that statement by him? Just yes or no? You may not. If you don't, tell me no. I, I, I yeah, yes. Okay. I remember it's reporting. Well, I'm going to do better than report it. Uh, his predictions came true in this designation given that his recommendation was totally inconsistent with methods applied by EPA, other EPA regions and was not based on any sound science. So my, I guess my first question is, why did EPA headquarters rubber stamp his recommendation, which was inconsistent with other EPA regions and not based on a sound scientific record? This is on Wise County? Yes. Well, uh, the factors that EPA looks into when it tries to define the area that's contributing to the non-attainment is the sources of pollution in those areas, uh, the connectivity in the metropolitan area in terms of people commuting or jobs uh, that may be in, in the different locations and how people move around and what the emission sources are. And so I think that that uh, decision was based on those kinds of data. Um, when um, Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, <coughs> so I, I would... I want to also say uh, and just read you some of what his statement was. He said, but as I said, oil and gas is an enforcement priority. It's one of seven, so we're going to spend a fair amount of time looking at oil and gas production. And I gave, I was in a meeting once and gave an analogy to my staff about my philosophy of enforcement. And I think it was probably a little crude and maybe not appropriate. It was kind of like how the Romans used to conquer little villages in the Mediterranean. They'd go into a little Turkish town somewhere, they'd find the first five guys, and they would crucify them. And then you know that that town was really easy to ma manage for the next few years. That was his statement. So as you make examples of people who are in this case not compliant with the law, find people who are not compliant with the law, and you hit them as hard as you can. And I ask in permission to have this inserted into the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. And. Uh, I'd just like to explain, for you to explain, given the evidence that we've seen of his indisputable bias against the fossil fuel industry, including this transcript that's going to be in the record, and it's in the Senate record also, of his comments about wanting to crucify oil and gas companies, which I offer, have offered for the record. So I guess my question to you is whether or not uh, you commit to me to re-examine the decision and ensure that EPA applies a standard and methodology consistent with all the EPA regions. No, I don't think uh, that's course, asking uh, too much. Of course I can commit to that. Uh, that, pol that statement and, the, and the, the policy that it might uh, be implicated with is not the policy of EPA. EPA's policy is the fair application of the law. Well, it hasn't been and hadn't been based on science, and we've proven that many times. I yield Gentlemen, back my time. time. I hear the gavel. At, the, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. I thank the chairman for uh, holding this hearing, and I thank uh, the uh, assistant administrator for coming. And I'm going to explore a local issue, uh, if you don't mind too much. Uh, the state revolving fund programs provided more than $5 billion nationally each year for water quality projects such as wastewater treatment, non-point source pollution control, watershed and estuary management. These programs' missions address 
many of the issues that face California current water systems. Meanwhile, the controversial Bay Delta Conservation Plan, a uh, minimum $15 billion project, continues to receive resources from federal government despite serious doubts about its environmental attributes and benefits. Do you believe that it's prudent for the state of California and federal agencies to commit scarce resources to the BDCP before the state even uses the $455 million that has already been allocated and unused through the state revolving fund? Um, what we, there are many needs, and what we're, our uh, general objective is to make sure that we work with the states to get those funds into, into use. And so that is um, what we're doing across the country. Okay, well, I, I just want to submit that that uh, is a dubious plan, and it's receiving federal resources despite the fact that the state has already got a large chunk of money that's unused. Um, the EPA, along with other agencies, will analyze proposed actions related to the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, but as currently drafted, the BDCP will consist of two large tunnels capable of diverting the entire Sacramento River around the Sacramento Delta. As currently drafted, do you believe that that's a permittable plan? Um, I think we're in the process of reviewing that uh that plan at this time. So uh, it's an interagency process among all, you know, the Department of Interior. EPA is a, a, a small but not insignificant, uh, uh, has a small but not on insignificant role in that, in the review of that plan, which is uh, being led mostly by the Department of Interior. But, so I can't, I don't have the evaluation yet of uh, what the federal government thinks about that overall, overall plan. Well, again, I submit um, that, that plan, as currently drafted, uh, has serious environmental impacts uh, in the entire delta, uh, including um, endangered species implications. So I submit uh, that you look at that very carefully when it becomes I, I, in front I, I of will. You. And, and um, I, I, I worked on the Bay Delta plan in the 90s um, as an EPA employee back in the 90s in the Clinton administration. So I, I'm Gen personally generally familiar with the issues, but I have not yet uh, been participating in the review of that plan. Okay, thank you. The, uh, the NEPA would require that an agency must prepare a detailed environmental review discussing, among other, among other issues, alternatives to the proposed actions. Do you believe that an additional viable alternatives to the BDCP should be reviewed in this process? I mean, generally, that's what NEPA requires, as I think the state uh, state environmental right. uh, review law in California re uh, as well. But again, I, I do know that this, because of my past history almost 20 years ago now, uh, on this whole Bay Delta project, that many, many alternatives have been looked at through the years. So I don't know what the status of all of those are now. But I, I will look into it. Well, thank you. There's significant political pressure to move forward with one plan without considering the alternative. So, again, I submit that you okay. look at that carefully. Uh, the EPA is required to review and publicly comment on environmental impacts of proposed federal projects. The EPA is also the official recipient of all environmental impact statements prepared by federal agencies. How will the EPA's uh, fiscal year 14 budget request for the BDCP be used to continue to develop environmental impact statements and environmental impact reviews? Um, I, I believe that uh, that division in our, in our agency is uh, adequately funded in the 2014 budget to carry out its duty of reviewing the em environmental impact statements that we receive. I, we don't allocate it for every project. It's just a, a, a unit in the, in the agency. Well, what I was trying to get at was how much money is being uh, uh, allocated or used for those processes and other processes related to the BDCP. So if you could submit that. Yes. Yes, we will. Thank you. I yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, for five minutes. Let's see. Welcome here. A couple of questions I wanted to address here. First of all, I noticed in your um, opening statement here, uh, 
in the um, second paragraph. You said the President's fiscal year budget demonstrates that we can make critical investments to strengthen the middle class, create jobs, and grow the economy while continuing to cut the deficit in a balanced way. In the past, the administrator of the EPA, when before us, um, has said they did not take into account the impact of jobs of environmental policies. And I just wonder if your statement is a reflection of a change in policies, and that is that uh, creating jobs is important, and you'll be taking into account job impact of EPA policies. Is that true? Um, I think it would be um, in, within anyone's common sense mind that job creation is an important priority. And uh, while that is not the uh, that is not the um, provisions in some of the environmental laws that we are, are given by Congress, it certainly is something we look at in our economic analysis of our rules. I would hope so, because I know I represent a lot of coal miners. I represent a lot of people who deal with uh, natural gas, uh, nuclear. And uh, when we're looking at hundreds of thousands of people in the coal-related industries losing their jobs, uh, I oftentimes think one of the greatest threats to the environment is poverty, because when you have no money, it's hard to care about other things. So I'd appreciate that. I also want to know. Um, with regard to sue and settle, are you familiar with the concept of sue and settle is? And there was the accusations that the EPA may meet with or communicate in any way with outside groups that results in a lawsuit uh, with environmental groups who are suing the EPA or the U.S. government. And then the EPA continues to meet or communicate in any way whatsoever to come up with some sort of a settlement as another way of having a regulation go through. Has the EPA ever engaged in sue and settle practices, sometimes referred to as friendly lawsuits with environmental groups, to your knowledge? Um, well, uh, in the way you described it, I would say no. But we get sued and we do settle them. So, um, But are there so, discussions so, but, then between the EPA and these groups or with uh, many times these groups will move to have to bypass the legislative process and will sue and then the EPA works with them to come up with a regulation and it does that happen? Well, the, when we are sued, seven, about 70 percent, maybe a little over 70 percent of the lawsuits that come against EPA are on mandatory duties that we have under the laws that Congress enacted. And we, did, we didn't, didn't make the deadline or we aren't, there's a, a periodic review that we didn't do. And so those settlement discussions are often about what the schedule should be because we didn't meet the schedule that Congress had. A lot of those are by environmental groups, am I correct? Some are environmental groups uh, and, uh, and some are by, by business groups. I but uh, but they're, they're not on matters of law, they're on matters of schedule. If, if I'm, if but sometimes I'm they're to... also pushing for some issues too, such as uh, enforcement and activities there along those lines. And I know that, you know, certainly I'm, environmental groups have a right to uh, stand up for the things that they believe in, that's fine. Uh, it's been brought up before about the concern about then uh, these groups having some favorite uh, uh, practice with the EPA with regard to having fees waived. Uh, I think a number of us are concerned about uh, what may be a culture of conspiracy and abuse of power and abuse of the public trust when it favors any group over any other groups. And certainly I think it violates a fundamental pillar of our nation with regard to fairness and freedom and democracy that no one should be beneath uh, or above the law whether it's the IRS targeting some groups, um, pro-Israel groups, conservative groups, or uh, difficulty with this committee has with getting information on Solyndra or, or other committees have with Fast and Furious and Benghazi, et cetera. And I've got to tell you where that oftentimes has left this committee is it's difficult, if not impossible, to trust agencies that have some ties with some other political motivation to nurture some and silence others. Now, I want to know if it will be a change in the practice of the EPA to either give everybody uh, waived fees with, the, uh, with uh, FOIA or everybody will have to pay. I don't know another way around it. If, you know, when you're talking about plus 90 percent in one direction and then 90 percent in another, it's hard to deny that there's some other motivation there. And so I wonder if this is going to be a, a change in some policy of the EPA that we can look to to say that they're going to treat everybody with the same fairness. Well, our policy is to, 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 tre to treat everybody the same on that, and so um, on, on everything we do. Then that would so, have to be. Um, well, along those lines, too, I hope you'll submit for the record, too. Let us know how much the value of those waived fees are. 
Because yeah. obviously, if that's not needed by the EPA, that might be an area we can make some cuts. Yeah, I, I absolutely would. And I'm, as I mentioned earlier in, in response to a, a, a question on this matter, even, even when fees are not waived under the process that currently is there, it's frequently that there are no fees involved anyway because of the nature of the way we do it these days on electronically. But I, uh, we will provide that information to the Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Thank you for being here to review the uh, EPA budget. Uh, I represent the Tampa Bay area in Florida, and my local communities truly value the partnership that they have with uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, whether it's uh, the Brownfields Initiative, where the city of Tampa just won a, a substantial grant to help put some uh, contaminated property back into productive use uh, for some uh, business owners there, or it's the diesel refit initiative uh, that the city of St. Petersburg won a, a grant for that's going to help clean the air and help them change over their their fleet, or it's uh, the clean water revolving loan program or drinking water revolving loan program uh, that are substantially underfunded and are underfunded in this budget again and then are suffering another uh, reduction. Uh, these are, when we're talking about job creation, these are important and very modest investments that help our communities create jobs, whether it's the brownfields, the business owner that has an opportunity to to uh, expand a business because that property is no longer contaminated or it's uh, the, the engineering firm or construction firm that's hired on a, uh, to fix the old pipes that we have miles and miles of these old leaky pipes uh, throughout our community. It's, we have to recognize the leverage we get what, through those important but very modest investments uh, creates a lot of jobs. So I, we value that partnership, and I, I wish that the United States Congress would end the sequester, replace the sequester, so that we can continue to make those job-creating uh, investments. Uh, but I wanted you to, to focus today on a, a great success uh, by the EPA, and that's uh, fuel economy standards. And all you have to do is, is uh, get in your car and see the type of cars that Americans are, are purchasing right now. And one um, personal story, I have a member of the family who had, who leased one of those new hybrid uh, plug-in electric vehicles in October of last year. It came from the dealer with a full tank of gas. And uh, since that time, uh, he has never been to the gas station and has gotten, and is averaging about 500 miles per gallon has never been to the gas station since the car was leased in October. Uh, it's a remarkable, uh, it's kind of a revolution what's going on in that field. But just in fuel economy, if you look at what's happening in, uh, with the ability to put money back in the, into the pockets of American consumers because the Obama administration and the, a couple Congresses ago pushed and said this, the technology exists. Could you quantify what has happened with fuel economy? Uh, summarize what, has, what kind of savings consumers have realized over the past few years, the money back in their pocket, the, the clean air benefits, and then the recent announcement uh, to go even further. Yes. Well, I, as, uh, thank you for those comments. And I think, as you've already pointed out, to put a little bit of, of measure into it, you know, obviously uh, for... Um, the, economy, the fuel economy and greenhouse gas standard combined uh, program that we've put in place to provide a, a, a level playing field for all the automobile manufacturers and coordinate with DOT and the state of California to make sure it's all the same and, and uh, working together, uh, that's going to double uh, the average fuel economy for, uh, for American automobiles uh, by uh, 2025. And every year, uh, the fleet a fuel economy is going to continue to improve, and the amount of pollution from it is going to continue to go down. So you're going to have significant public health benefits, and you're going to obviously have savings at the pump. And we, we would expect over the life of that program, compared to the way vehicles are today, that we're probably talking about over a trillion dollars of savings uh, over time. Now, that translates not only into more money 
into the economy that would then also do, you know, as people purchase things or whatever, create jobs. But, but it also improves our national security because we're reducing every year um, our dependence on imported oil. We're not there yet, but and we have you know, we have product, we have production uh, growth as well in the country of of our natural resources. So when you look at all these things together holistically, uh, we really are uh, improving our overall profile. Um, I could probably tell you the public health benefits because somebody just gave me the piece of information here, but for nitrogen oxide, it's 6.9 million tons, uh, VOCs, 592 million tons. Uh, the net benefits that we've calculated on public health side is about 174 billion. So um, I appreciate your question. Thank you. Ladies, time's expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Good morning, and thank you for <clears throat> being with us this morning. Thank you for your forbearance in this uh, this lengthy interview process. But it is it is important. I think you would agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I too drive a hybrid. I've had it for ten years time. Uh, back when I bought my hybrid, price of gasoline was actually a lot less. So I can't really say I bought it because I'm cheap, which I am. But I really bought it because then I could have that sense of moral superiority that a hybrid affords you, and I still enjoy that today. Listen, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that have come up during this, uh, <clears throat> during this hearing. First off, what is the mission of the EPA? I'm sorry, say that again? What is the mission of the EPA? What well, is your our, core function? Well, our mission obviously is to uh, protect public health and, 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 and the environment. Um, our Stop prime... there, that's good, that's a sound bite, I'll accept that. And, but the, if you go to the next level, it's essentially to implement the laws that Congress has enacted for EPA to uh, to be the and I'll accept that as a, as a secondary. Now we've heard a lot of discussion here this morning about the sequester and the effects of the sequester, how it should be undone. But you know, I would just simply ask you: you're, you're the you're the boss of the EPA, right? You're the head honcho of the EPA. The current acting head honcho. Yeah, yes. Right, head honcho. It's, <clears throat> we keep it simple here for this committee. And your boss is uh, President Obama. Correct. And President Obama in August of 2011 signed a very famous law now called the Budget Control Act, did he not? I'm certain he did. And incorporated in that Budget Control Act was a condition known as a sequester, is that correct? Yes. This is something that was asked for by the administration, asked for by Jack Lew at the time was Chief of Staff or Head of Office Management of the Budget. They asked the Congress to pass this law, the Congress accommodated, now, to his credit, the president has not had to come back to the Congress with another debt limit discussion since August of 2011. So you could certainly argue he achieved his goal of wanting to get past Election Day and, and, and then some. So that worked. Now, why is it that you, as his agent at the Environmental Protection Agency, <clears throat> cannot perform your core mission under the guidance of your president who said there will be a reduction in funding for the EPA under the sequester. Why is it you're having trouble doing that? Well, I'm, I'm reporting to this committee the impacts of doing that. Well, let me just ask you this. Why is it that it's only in federal agencies, and we certainly saw this, that there's not your area, but the Department of Transportation with the FAA flap a few weeks ago, when you gotta do budget cuts, they immediately have to hurt people. I was in private business for a number of years. There were plenty of times where I fell on lean times and I had to look at my budget and I had to squeeze seven cents out of every dollar that I spent. Otherwise, I wasn't going to be able to provide my core mission. And we did it, but I didn't lay off my scheduler. I did it in a way that allowed the business to continue to function and continue to take care of those patients who came into my medical practice. Why is it when in the private sector, when times get tough and you've got to make budget cuts, we try to do those in a way that minimizes the impact on our clients, patients, or customers, and yet in federal agencies, let's extract the maximum amount of pain. Why is that? Well, I don't, I can't, I can't ascribe to that particular point of view, but, sir, but, when but, I I, heard... I, but I'm giving you the information as best I can of what those across the 
board kinds of reductions have done in, in our agency. You, the flexibility that you just suggested that you have in private industry is not afforded to me as the head of the agency because I have to make the cuts in every and, program. And, and yet within you do that, have I've some done discretionary the best I can. authority, I would submit. And look, you know, you, you've got some stuff listed here of, of things that, and it, I realize it wasn't your helm at the time, but in 2014, Lisa Jackson goes to the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, referred to as Rio Plus 20, Agenda 21, whatever you want to call it. How much did we spend to do that? What was the... How much did we spend to send Lisa Jackson I don't to Rio know the Plus answer. 20? I, I don't know the answer to can that. Can you find that out and, and get that information that back to me? Certainly. It seems to me that would be a far better place to cut rather than when Henry Waxman goes through your cutting radiation safety and air quality this would be a better place to cut. And if I were to advise you on how to look at your budget and make it work and comply with your core mission, th these are the types of activities I would ask you to look at. I've and I cannot believe your boss, the president, did not do that. And I, I think that's a failing on the part of the administration because they did ask for the sequester. Remember, that was the baseline. I, mean, I can attest to the fact that he signed the bill, but I was not involved with any of the negotiations. On and it. I appreciate that you weren't, <laughs> and, uh, um, but, you're, but you're now to do the job, correct? Yes, I am, and I just want you to know that I did cut the agency's travel budget in half. Good for you. Eliminate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'll yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, let me, let me tell you that I was going to ask about the discrepancies on the FOIA matter, but I believe that, that that has been covered. However, I had originally intended to drop that question, but I don't want you or anybody else to believe that I think it's a waste of time ever to try to reassure this, this committee and the American people that we're trying to have a just system and the appearances, as previous folks have said, the appearances are that when it comes to the waiving of the fees that it has not been just that somebody is placing their finger on the scales of justice. I believe that what you've laid out talking to the, the Inspector General and all makes sense, but I don't want anybody thinking that we think it's a waste of time to try to assure the American people that we're setting up a just system. I, I don't believe that for a minute. I feel and it's I appreciate one, one of my most important responsibilities as a public servant. And, and as a part of trying to make sure we have a just uh, system, there have been concerns with the sue and settle process that the EPA frequently agrees to. Uh, what we believe to be unrealistic deadlines for issuing major rules that are going to impose massive new costs on businesses and consumers. The schedules the EPA agrees to may not allow the EPA enough time to collect the data the agency needs or enough time for the public to review the rule and offer mean meaningful com comment. Can you commit that going forward the EPA will consult with affected stakeholders before committing to those deadlines? <laughs> Um, one of the things that um, I'm committed to doing is when there's a request for um, a, um, when we have a petition and a, or a request to do a rulemaking on whatever schedule, to post that request on the web so that all the stakeholders can see it and then whatever process that is required under the Administrative Procedures Act, et cetera, which is also already Well, I would encourage you to go a little bit further than just posting, although that certainly would be helpful, because I believe that, that going, uh, as we go forward, being more transparent and involving all the affected stakeholders in the process will help ensure that the EPA does not commit to unrealistic deadlines. In the case of the Clean Air Act, consent decrees before they're entered by the court, there's a statutory opportunity for the public to comment. Does the EPA publish copies of the actual rulemaking settlements and proposed consent degrees, decrees in the Federal Registry or Register? Excuse me. The, uh, all of the consent decrees under the Clean Air Act, for sure, have to be published in the Federal Register. But is that done they, when, when you're discussing this? There's supposed to be an opportunity for the public to comment before uh, they're entered by the court. Do you put it into the public register? Yes that the, the, before the court enters the decree. Right. It goes out for public comment, and then when the public comment period is over, the comments are reviewed, and then that's when it gets entered into the court. All right. Um, does this opportunity for public comment ever result in changes to, the set, to a settlement? Because we're only aware of one instance where uh, involving technology and residual, re residual risk reviews for various source agencies where that occurred. Um, I don't have that information. I don't have information. Can you get on that, that information? But I can certainly for us. get that for you. I, I do know that we also get 
uh, once once we complete um, some rulemaking, we often get uh, requests for re reconsideration of those rules as well, and which we have done on many occasions. And I appreciate that. Sorry, my time is short. I've got to keep moving. Um, yes, sir. There are some in the agency in the past related to uh, Utility Act and other regulations that have indicated that uh, coal-fired power plants are not being retired because of regulations, but because of the low cost of natural gas. Of course, natural gas costs are going back up. Uh, but while some have made that argument, and we've retired 41,000 megawatts of coal-fired generation, there's a Duke University uh, Nicholas School of the Environment that has concluded that the cost of complying with tougher EPA air quality standards could spur an increased shift away from coal and toward natural gas for electric generation. Also, in April 23, 23 of this year analysis, the Energy Information Administration explained that the interaction of fuel prices and environmental, environmental rules is a key factor in coal plant retirements. How do you make the two of those fit? And, and I would submit that what you've got is that the regulations are, in fact, retiring these agencies. And like uh, Mr. Rush said earlier, he's concerned about what happens to poor folks. In my district, they're, they're having a hard time paying their electric bills and their food and their, their drugs, particularly for my elderly who are trying to survive on a fixed income. And I'm just wondering if the EPA takes any of that into consideration when they're trying to make these decisions, because when I raised this last year with your predecessor, she said, or I guess it was a year and a half ago, she said, uh, we have programs to take care of that, but in the budget, not your budget, but in another part of the budget, the president actually cut the LIHEAP program, which would have helped folks with their heat bills and their electric bills. How do you, how do you justify or make all of that work together? Well, first of all, um, we do analyze what we think the impact of the regulations will be on potential closures, and you, you're correct that it's compl a complex mix of what the age of the plant is, what it would cost to continue to keep it running and fix it up versus uh, modernizing with another kind of plant. Um, our estimates continue to show that um, a very small amount, but not, an ins not a zero amount, of the uh, changing that's going on in the industry, which has been going on for 10 years. Um, uh, is not due to the regulations, the, but the regulations are no doubt have a, have a role to play there, and we've analyzed that and, and we've been public about it. Um, I, I want to. I know that um, this has come up several times, and you know, I went ahead and looked a, a couple of weeks ago at what the projections are, even under the current situation that you're bringing up here, that EIA and others have put out there. What coal production and coal usage for electric generation will be in the future, and it's still fairly robust. I mean, there's no expectation on our part, nor desire on our part, to have coal not be part of the, of the uh, diversity of fuels that are available uh, for electric generation in the United States. And all of our projections, including EIA, show that, that will, they will con it will continue to play a, a role. Gentlemen's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Per, uh, Perciusepi, a baseball practice is at 6.30 in the morning. If you want to know where it's at, I play, so I, I, I can give you the direction. I, I think Mr. Hall was saying if I'm invited to the committee, I, and I was going back to the other one. Oh, okay. I will, of course, come if the committee invites me. Okay, great. Um, as the former assistant administrator for AIR, you're well aware that under the Clean Air Act, the agency historically has always subcategorized fuel types, yeah. not just between coal and natural gas, but sub-coal types, such as subituminous or lignite. Why did the agency break with that tradition on the NSPS for greenhouse gases and set one standard, a natural gas standard? Well, I think when the proposal was made, um, there was some careful consideration that there uh, would be technology available that would enable everybody to meet the same performance standard. Uh, because there's some question about the technology, that proposal actually recommended a 30-year averaging period so that, you know, you would allow the technology to catch up. So we felt like there was uh, an ample opportunity for a diversity of fuels there, regardless of the single performance standard. That said, we've received, as I think you know, uh, significant comment on this issue, and it is certainly something that we are trying to 
analyze ourselves right now as to what the final rule will look like. So will the new NSPS rule that comes out of the EPA have not only subcategories uh, sub for fuel types for coal and natural gas, but also uh, back to those subtypes for different types of coal? Well, the, we're looking at the comment that we got on that. I can't say what the final one's going to be yet because we're still in that, that, we're still in that process. I would certainly urge you to, to consider that because uh, it leads me to my second line of questioning here is dealing with cost and, and benefits. As regulations become more complex and expansive, would you agree that impacts may affect more than just the directly regulated sector uh, due to price effects and other costs that ripple through uh, the economy. Would you agree that taking fuller measures and estimates of energy price effects and other costs up front would be important for fuller understanding of regulatory impacts uh, ec uh, economy-wide? Yeah, I, I think that this issue is a pretty important issue and is one that we are, we've been working on how, what kind of analytical tools can we get that will really enable us to do that. You just heard me answer the member from California about the, no, Florida, I'm sorry, about the, um, uh, the fact that our uh, car, uh, st the fuel economy slash greenhouse gas rules for the cars are going to cut the amount of gasoline in half, and that translates into less money spent, and, and then that money obviously will have uh, another um, uh, another potential benefit in the economy. We but you're have, talking about benefits there. Have, what about right. the cost implications right. so to just, the industry? Right. Well, yeah. we have to look at both of those when we do this. So we are committed to continue to move in that direction. And I've I've actually had some conversations with the Senate committee about uh, uh, convening some panels to well, our, us our, do the, deal with. Our that. committee has heard testimony that for its major air rules, the EPA has failed, at least during this administration, to look at economy-wide impacts. Uh, we understand that economic modeling uh, can more fully account for the economy-wide impacts of regulations by measuring the ripple effects of prices through other sectors of the economy uh, not directly affected by the regulations. This provides a fuller picture of job shifts and other economic impacts. We understand that since 1997, the EPA has conducted economy-wide modeling of regulatory impacts, just two uh, major air rules, both in 2005. Can you explain why the EPA has not performed such modeling during this administration? The models that exist are not um, adequate to do what you're suggesting. Those were attempts to do it, and they were... What are you doing to update the modeling? Well, we, I was trying to answer you um, that, that I've, I've suggested to... Uh, your Senate counterparts that we uh, convene a, a panel of economists and, and look for uh, advice from them on what kind of models we can use to do this kind of impact across the, that looks at both the benefits and the costs. Because if you're going to look at the whole economy, you've got to look at both sides of that equation. Can I then take that uh, going forward? It sounds like you're making a commitment that the EPA will undertake uh, in the coming fiscal year to look at the economy-wide impacts of its major rules using state-of-the-art economic modeling. Is that, is that what I'm hearing what you, you What you heard me commit to do is try to find out if there are models that we can actually do that with. So, I mean, this is 2013. We've got a lot of smart people, particularly in the EPA. Uh, surely you can find a modeling methodology. We're, we're pretty good at this kind of stuff. Uh, am I hearing that you're, you're making gonna, a we're commitment gonna, to address we're, we're, the we're modeling? Gonna, we're going to convene uh, an expert panel of economists to, to, to uh, give us some advice on that. We've done some of it. We've done it on our 812 cumulative impact analysis on the Clean Air Act. We've done it on a couple of rules. Um, getting the benefit side right as well as the cost side right is the, is the tough piece. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Louisiana, uh, Dr. Cassidy, for five hey. minutes. Hey, sir. Thanks for coming. Listen, um, uh, just so happens this morning, I was meeting with some folks that um, wholesalers of fuel. And so they tell me that there is an EP in October of 2011, the EPA Office of Underground Storage Tanks announced a proposed revision to the 1988 Federal Underground Storage Tank Regulation. And industry stakeholders, along with the Petroleum Marketers Association of America, submitted comments. EPA estimated the compliance cost to be about $900 per year per facility, 
while the petroleum marketeers and others estimate true cost to be $6,100 per year. Now, of course, this concerns them. Uh, and they're requesting that the EPA withdraw the proposed rule, which is to be finalized in October of 13 this year, and form a small business regulatory advisory panel to determine the true compliance cost. They tell me a letter was received from EPA, and the letter did not agree to the, the regulatory advisory panel. Um, I mean, here's a bunch of folks, some of whom are mom and pop, some of whom are large and they're looking at a compliance cost of $6,100 a year, and I gather this is for the double tanks, not for the older uh, steel with fiberglass, but the current double tanks, so the ones which presumably are safer. Of course this is a concern. Now, I've heard about this issue this morning, but I'm here to represent those folks providing services. Your thoughts on this, and what can we do about it? Um. Knowing that you may not be familiar with it, uh, if you have to get back. You said, uh, let me make sure I understood. You said there was a response already presented. There was a letter sent back, and, and apparently there still remains disagreement as to what the true compliance okay. costs are. Well, I can. I, I don't know the familiar. I'm not familiar with this specific issue that you're bringing up, um, but I can. I can commit to you uh, okay. and to the committee that that I will look into it personally, find out what the issues are. Um, I do quite a bit of work myself with the small business. Uh, part of our agency, um, both in terms of our own acquiring of yes. services as well as uh, should be interested to know 50, almost 50% 50 of our purchasing of services as an agency is by small businesses. But I, I'm sensitive to this, and I'll find out what, the, what it is. and get uh, True compliance costs, and if there's a reluctance to form that advisory committee or at least have some ad hoc committee which uh, comes to agreement. I, I understand uh, what those panels are, yes. Secondly, um, in a previous hearing on formaldehyde, we had a, a report from National Academy of Science which is pilloried the methodology used by uh, EPA. And at the time, I understand there was other critiques, very sharp, of how EPA is basing their regulations. Uh, now, I'm a doc, a, a physician, and I keep on wondering if the criticism is that your methodology is unclear, and that those articles selected among the many to choose from do not support the conclusions in this case of causing cancer or such like that. Why can't EPA beginning tomorrow write documents that have clear methodology and have the same sort of standard that a peer reviewed journal would require for such a thing? I, 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 so one, my question is why not? And two, uh, if you say you're going to do so, when will that begin? Yeah, I, and I would, I would agree with you. Why not? And, and so uh, after we got that report um, a couple of years ago, we uh, immediately embarked on a, uh, a, on a modification of how we do those programs. We've done a couple of them already. We've submitted them back to the National Academy of Sciences to see if we're getting it right. Um, we've hired a new head of, the, of that part of our Office of Research and Development who is in the process of putting some additional uh, modifications of that together, and we expect to be getting that out in the public shortly. So we're, we're in that, uh, we're re in the middle, if not near the end, I hope, so, of so I know that some of these rules take a while to develop. Those that are halfway through the process, will they be redone to include this new, improved we're, kind of standard we're, methodology? We're trying to catch the, the catch as many of them as we can in, in mid-process. Keep in mind, these 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 are the uh, science assessments; they're not the actual. Let rules. me get one more Still question, required. if I can, real quickly. Um, also, oftentimes EPA will make a rule, and I gather that the data is not made public. At least Congress doesn't know what the data is, and this may be related to it being proprietary. But heck. They're doing it with federal funds, and I know there's a big push to have those medical research papers done with federal funds to have open source or free download. It seems like if this is being done with an EPA grant, we should be able to see that data, as should anybody who would want to uh, look at that methodology. You see where I'm coming from? Yes. Uh, and thoughts about that? What's the obstacles to getting the data? Can we start making that data base? Public? Well, there's two, there's two categories of information uh, that fall into this, this world. One is sort of the uh, computer models and survey instruments and questionnaires that are used in the gathering of the information. And then, of course, there's the information itself. You have to sort of look at those things together. So uh, whenever, um, and so um, in the particular interest, in, instance we were currently uh, working uh, to, to on this on this issue 
we obviously don't currently have the, 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 the data in our possession, so we have to work with the researchers and the other funders. Usually there's many, many funders, even if, even if EPA is a small funder. So yes, we understand this, this issue, and yes, we are in the process of trying to, in the, in the, in the case of some of the particulate matter uh, um, epidemiological studies that I think you're probably mm -hmm. referring to, we're in the process of trying to get some of those questionnaires and, and that, that have the, the front end part of the data, and then we're, we're going to probably continue talking to the researchers about how to do I would yield back. I'll yield back. We're out of time. You've been generous. But I would say, wouldn't it be great if in terms of your contract up front you said your condition of accepting this contract right. is that this must be made public? This okay. time, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Perceppi, for your time in front of this committee. Uh, just a, a quick question. Are, are you familiar with the Colorado Regional Hayes State Implementation Plan? I, I know one exists, but I can't tell you. Perfect. If you don't mind, I'd have some questions for you for the record to follow up yes, if you want, if yes, you don't sir. mind about that. I uh, wanted to just shift a little bit over to some budget questions. Uh, we've heard people on this committee characterize the, the budget reductions as a result of sequestration as catastrophic, as ending the world as we know it. Uh, maybe uh, people believe that. Uh, talking about dire consequences uh, with the reductions, and I think it's a, what, a 3.5 percent reduction overall to the EPA budget from, uh, from 2013 to 2014? From 12. Well, 13, okay. it's lower because of the sequestration. Uh, Excuse me, right. Oh, so about a half a billion dollars. 2013, about a 3.6 percent reduction, 3.5 percent reduction. Um, Does that sound right? And you're aware that uh, almost 80 percent of the households in America had about a 2 percent tax increase uh, at the beginning of this year? Our budget in, um, just to go back here, our budget in 2012 was $8.45 billion, right? And uh, this, so it's about, yeah, so you're this just, request is $8.15 billion. Okay. And uh, so you're aware, though, that most Americans, almost 80 percent of households, experienced a 2 percent tax increase at the beginning of this year? I, the payroll tax increased? I, it, it, I, did, I, it did. It did. The payroll I tax no increased. no reason to, to. But I want to just talk a little bit about the budget here. I have some charts I'd like to share with you. And so this chart, we talk about budget cuts and what's happening. We talk about the impact that they've had on the EPA. This chart shows agencies with the most regulatory actions reviewed by OMB from 2009 to the present. Well, EPA is second. Uh, you have the second most regulatory actions reviewed by OMB, the second most uh, concluded by OMB, and actually it looks like you have the highest number of actions pending. And this is despite uh, cataclysmic budget cuts. Uh, if you look at the EPA rules finalized and published in the Federal Register, this chart shows uh, that you have a, a, in 2012, you finalized 635 rules spanning 5,637 pages. This despite record budget cuts that would be ending the world as we know it. This chart here shows agencies with the most regulatory actions currently under review, going back to the other chart, the EPA 21, the highest of any other of these agencies. Uh, are you familiar? You were not there in 2009. Are you familiar with the budget in 2009, EPA's budget in 2009? Um. It's about $7.6 billion in 2009. Uh, the budget request for 2014 is about $8.1 billion, so about half a billion dollar difference. Uh, the, the, in 2010, the EPA budget was about $10.3 billion, which was a 30% uh, increase from 2009. Uh, and so the budget has come down a little bit at the EPA. Uh, the budget request right now is about $296 million less than the 2012 enacted level. Uh, isn't it true that in this year's EPA budget, the, you're, you're just requesting half a billion dollars more than the agency received, though, in 2009? Is that correct? We're, re we're requesting less than we received in 2012. But in 2009, it's about half a billion dollars more than the 2009. 2009 budget. and 2010, there was a large influx of infrastructure money under the American Recovery Act. And, and so there was... Uh, and, and, and related infrastructure money, is, for water and sewer. Is uh, the air cleaner today than it was in 2009? I would hope so. Will the air be cleaner next year than it was uh, in 2009? I would hope so. And so we're doing that despite the fact that there have been budget reductions? Well, the regulations we put in place every year, the cars are cleaner. So every year we buy 13 million new cars, thank goodness. And, and, then, and so uh, that's happening they're, despite they're, the budget reductions? Because of the regulations. That, and the, that will happen in the future because of the regulations. Despite the budget reductions? 
first of all, let me just say the numbers you have up there um, don't appear to match the numbers that I, I mean, the ones that are in well, the We're happy process. to take your numbers. I'm, I'm happy well, to Well, all right. My numbers. numbers are for the first four years of this administration, we finalized or proposed 434 rules compared to 536 the last four years of the last administration. So I, I have very different numbers well, on the happy, rules. Happy done. to look at those numbers. However, the, we can the, make new charts with your numbers. But I just ask you a question. Are we reducing air pollution? at $8.1 billion request, as we were with $7.6 billion. Are we going to have cleaner air next year? Well, if I point to the automobiles as a particular example. So, um, the, so the answer is yes. The regulations that we put in place have been since 2009. So, so the answer is yes. So we're actually able to have cleaner air today with more money than we did last year, with more money than we did in 2000, 2009. So even though you're not getting $296 million as much as you were last year, we're going to have cleaner air. And I never said we weren't. Okay. Good. Uh, does, the, does the EPA track com total amount of the new compliance costs it's imposing through regulations every year? We do a cumulative uh, an assessment of the Clean Air Act. What about other regulations? Can you, do you track compliance costs on uh, that a regulation is going well, to have? We, we have some retrospective studies going on to look at what our estimates of the cost were and what they ended up actually being. Usually that and it ends up being less. Can you provide the committee with total new compliance costs associated with all the new rules issued by the agency in 2012? Um, I, I can talk, well, whatever we've analyzed, we can provide. Uh, because I, I think if we're talking about the fact that EPA's budget's missing $296 million from last year. We have to remember that businesses are actually paying more in energy costs because of so, uh, EPA regulations, that they're paying more because of payroll tax increases this year. And so when the EPA comes here and complains about a 3% a tax or 3% budget Mr. cut, Chairman. the so, fact that households across this country have had their budget cuts, businesses have had their budget cuts, I think we ought to know that. And I think that I, I would yield back my time. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, welcome, our colleague. I know you've, uh, Mr. Persepti, you've been here a while now. I personally have very interested for a number of years in the issue of electronic waste, and I've been working on the issue. We actually have legislation the last couple terms, and I've noticed that some in EPA believe the agency should spend money and build capacity for managing e-waste in developing companies countries. While I agree that these countries need to do more to develop their capacity to manage their own e-waste, we must address the e-waste problem we have domestically. Uh, greater investment in responsible recycling here at home could go far in helping curb e-waste problems overseas. The committee recently held a briefing with the U.S. International Trade Commission regarding its study on e-waste and found that several industrialized countries such as Sweden, Belgium, and Korea have high-tech smelting facilities that specialize in recovering gold, copper, and valuable metals from the electronic waste. We were told, also told that no similar facilities operate in the United States. Um, first of all, how much money did EPA request for international efforts to address electronic waste? I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't oh, no. know. I don't know. Well, I, I, can, uh, I think we could find that out. I guess one of my concerns is coming from an industrial area, um, seem like we might have some impediments for creating one of those um, facilities that high-tech smelting operations, because I know the problems with smelting, uh, just like in my area, I have refineries in East Harris County, but uh, is there something that the United States should say, we want to be able to do this and create that on that our own high-tech smelting operation? Obviously, if these countries like Belgium and Sweden uh, could be able to do it, or even South Korea, we should be able to do it under our environmental laws. Uh, but and we'll go on to that later, too, uh, in another time. Has EPA supplied the state-of-the-art smelting facilities abroad, studied the uh, smelting facilities abroad that specialize in processing e-waste and recovering the valuable metals? Do you know of anything uh, that the EPA has done on that? Um, we've been working in a on a voluntary way with many of the large producers of, of electronic uh, products uh, to come up with a, a long-term strategy. Uh, we have a partnership with a number of them. Uh, I'm sure that uh, in the people who are working on that, and it's a priority for us okay. to try to work on that. If you could get back with, the, your broth, uh, with on, the committee, yes, I'd appreciate it. Um, Next question. On recent testimony, you mentioned that you were postponing the release of the diesel guidance document for hydraulic fracking and mentioned this would dovetail with a larger EPA study. Can you elaborate on how guidance to the 
uh, UIC regulatory personnel on use of diesel during operation correlates with either the prospective or re re retrospective case study on the larger EPA study? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to. Um, first of all, um, I, I think, as you probably know, the, um, the, the, the underground injection control program uh, was, uh, um, doesn't get involved with the hydraulic fracturing uh, as a general matter because of uh, 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 exclusions in the law. Yeah. And what, but that, that, that in, but the study was required but, by Congress. But, but the study was required by Congress. The, the fact that when diesel fuel is used, uh, remained in the law. So in the study that's undergoing, we are, we are working with some of the businesses to, with, and some with, with some of the producers on um, technology and approaches they're using for um, exploration and production of natural gas wells, and we're looking at what the best management practices are. And we may learn from some of that, from some of the companies and some of the retrospective and prospective studies we're doing what what um, new approaches might be available for well bore integrity and things of that nature, and it would seem that there's some logic to being uh, to whatever we might do in in the case where there's diesel fuel use, it would want to benefit from what we're learning there. Okay, I'm using that as an example. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, EPA, and I look forward to the study because, uh, but as I've said before, but to, uh, to administrators and even our uh, Energy Secretary, you know, if we make it impossible to frack, we shut down this huge growth uh, in reasonable price energy. So we need to make sure it's done right yep. and safely. The last thing, and Mr. Chairman, for just a minute, our committee last Congress passed an e-manifest bill, and it was uh, for tracking hazardous waste shipments. And I appreciate EPA's work on that as our really good bipartisan legislation came out of our committee. Um, and the new electronic system will improve the transparency and uh, efficiency of the data. Um, could you not, if not today, but get back with us and because we want to do a fo follow up on how that is working with EPA and the success of it or yeah, lack of success? I, I think that would be a great idea as, as we're starting to formulate uh, the approach there that we come and give the committee, uh, you know, ag across the board a, a briefing on the status of that. It's a really good program. We're so appreciative of the work all of you have done on it. We'll work with them on that. Thanks, Mr. Green. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to talk about a uh, piece of legislation that I have, and it relates to a budget item that you have as well. Uh, this year, the EPA's budget calls for a little less than $63 million in chemical risk reduction and about $3.5 million in chemical risk management. Uh, included in that would be uh, enforcement of the Clean Air Act's general duty clause, Section 112R of the Clean Air Act. Uh, are, you, are you at least somewhat familiar with that provision? 112R. I, am for, I know what 112R is. Yes. Fair enough. So, so just to be clear, it's got, it's got, it says it, uh, has gen, uh, operators have a general duty to design and maintain a safe facility if they're processing, handling, or storing a specific list of chemicals, and then it says comma or other extremely hazardous hazardous substances, which EPA admits is undefined. There's been no guidance. There's been no guideline. Uh, in fact, uh, Ms. Jackson testified that there's uh, been no EPA definition of. Uh, extremely hazardous substance in, in front of this committee. Uh, it's a very vague law, and I think that creates an enormous regulatory risk. I think it's not the way to do it. <laughs> this bill's been in the hopper for a while. In light of what happened at the Internal Revenue Service this week, I think specificity is very reasonable to make sure that agencies don't prosecute these things in a way that are either inconsistent across regions or disfavored folks, whoever they might be. Uh, we saw what happened in West Texas, the, the tragedy there uh, related to ammo, ammo, excuse me, anhydrous ammonia uh, that was stored on site. Um, but that's regulated today by DHS, uh, uh, but is not listed, uh, not covered under e EPA's RMP program. It's not a... Not Ammoni a ammonium nitrate. I'm sorry, ammonium nitrate, excuse me. Uh, I, have, I have a couple of concerns. Uh, we've got this incredibly vague section uh, which doesn't provide notice for folks on how to store chemicals and what chemicals are covered. Uh, and then this general duty clause on top of it uh, that, that doesn't tell these operators what to do. Uh, so my legislation it does something very odd for someone that sits on this side of this. It asks EPA to issue a regulation. It asks you to clarify uh, what this means. I, 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 there, I got that out of my mouth and didn't choke. Uh, 
Uh, but I, I, right. I, I'm happy to withdraw the legislation if I could get you today to tell me that you all will begin the process to develop a regulation to clarify what's in the general duty clause and what it is you all intend to do with that. Um, I certainly commit to, to look at that. Um, you know, it's been looked at before. Um, and uh, because of the, the nature of what we're talking about, it, it gets complicated very quickly. And I think you're probably aware of it. And we also have um, the potential for uh, uh, the, the need to coordinate with other responsibilities like worker exposure and, and also national security, homeland security. Um, I think we're going to find out today um, from the state uh, mm -hmm. folks what, what their best guess is of what happened at West Texas. Um, they're, they're, they briefed the governor yesterday, and they're supposed to announce, I think, at noon or 1 o'clock uh, Texas time, Central Time. So um, we, I think what I heard was that the ammonia, it looked like the, it was the ammonia, ammonium nitrate, because we're, we're looking at under the Clean Air Act at this time is the stuff that would be in, getting into the air, which would be the anhydrous ammonia. And, if, a anhydrous, if the full tank of anhydrous ammonia at that particular facility leaked out in the middle of the night in the summer when everybody had their windows open, it would be quite a, a substantial impact. So, but your point is well taken. Um, I'm, I, am, um, I think that uh, in, in light of what happened, the tragedy there, and in light of uh, some of the work that you've been doing, it is certainly something we need to turn our attention to. Well, but well, I can't I, I admit to any particular uh, process at this time. Then I'll continue to proceed and we'll <laughs> hopefully we can work together to, to get this done. I just, why when you're in this constrained environment that we've been talking about all morning, you would seek to go regulate in a space that is already highly regulated, I have to tell you, it continues yeah. to confound me. Uh, uh, so, well, I, so I, that's why I'm, I'm in, the, uh, in the position to, to want to look at what all the other agencies do and maybe get that better coordinated before I would do anything else. That, that would be awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, last thing, the folks, uh, some folks here this morning have uh, used different uh, words to describe uh, EPA's budget in 2014. Someone suggested it was crippling. I probably heard the fact that we are gutting various statutes. Oh, gosh, I've been in Congress 27 months, so dozens and dozens of times. Uh, would you use uh, the 2014, would you describe the 2014 as crippling an agency with 18 some thousand employees? I think the, the 2014 budget that the president has proposed is adequate to, to obviously maintain what we're responsible to do. I mean, we wouldn't have proposed that budget if it wasn't. Um, but embedded in that budget are some real ideas to try to make ourselves even more efficient in the future. And again, I hope that the committee will see its way through. It's been a leader in the e-manifest, and I think that if you work with us on some of the other ideas to make, uh, make the agency more efficient, it would be in everybody's long-term interest. We, we look forward to that. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, and uh, Mr. Pachapi, I'm sorry to say this probably concludes the hearing, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we do appreciate your being with us very much this morning, and Mr. Rush and I and the other members look forward to having the opportunity to spend another morning with you soon, perhaps. And uh, the record will remain open for 10 days, and the staffs on both sides will be getting the uh, uh, material for a follow-up for additional comments from you all. And, and I won't forget my commitment at the <laughs> beginning of the hearing to get you the answers. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and that will conclude today's hearing. Thank you.